Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the board. Um, today is Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. Uh, we have from joining us with the members of the Board of Appeals. Um, we have Patrick Hanlon, Kevin Mills, Aaron Ford, Stephen Redlack, and Sean O'Rourke. Uh, town officials who are currently on the call, as I understand it. Um, Rick Valarelli, who's our board administrator. Uh, Doug Time, town council. Uh, Jennifer Rate, director of planning and community development. And Susan Chapnick, from the uh, chair of the conservation commission. Uh, representing uh, our council and uh, consulting engineers, Paul Haverty will be joining us. He had a conflict um, he thought would run until about 8 p.m., but he will join us at that time. Um, Jonathan Witten is here from KP Law. And then there's a team with us from Beta Group, who is our consulting engineers. Uh, when I understand Martin Nover, um, Greg Cohen, Todd Unsis, and Julia Stearns are on. And appearing for the <coughs> Uh, for the applicant for Thorndike Place, uh, Stephanie Kiefer from Smollett and Vaughn. Uh, so to open the meeting, I'd like to just give a brief introduction to this evening's meeting. This is an opening open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. It was conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period indicated on the posted agenda. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom webinar app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it is being broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others may be participating by phone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name or another identifier and take care not to share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording we ask that you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Um, So with that, I will bring us up to item two on the agenda, which is uh, approval of the meeting minutes. So these are the draft minutes for the August 11th hearing of the board. Um, I understand, Mr. Revok, you have a correction to item two, um, specifically the, the sentence on the, excuse me, on the second page regarding um, the approving the revised plan and you have sent comment I believe to the administrator to with that correction yes uh, the and the correction I had suggested was mr. Revelak noted that the board should specify which of the two submitted plans it was approving perfect are there any other com comments from the board in regards to the minutes yes Patrick you're you're on mute yep I got it up um, I have a vague recollection that one of us, I think it might have been Mr. O'Rourke, uh, did not vote on the um, previous minutes because he had not been at the hearing. But I may be wrong about that. Uh, but if so, that that would be a four to nothing vote rather than a five to nothing vote, I think. Is that right? Um. I believe, well, we had, no, well, no, because the five vote was okay because we had one of the associates vote. One of the associates. In, in the place of Roger, yeah. Thank you, though, for that. Any other questions regards to the minutes? With that in mind, um, may I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Pat. 
Is that a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 None opposed. Okay. <clears throat> so that brings us up to item number three, which is the comprehensive permit for Thorndike Place. Um, I just want to note at this time, uh, it occurred, I only found it this afternoon in regards to the items under the comprehensive permit. Um, I neglected to include a specific line item for the board to discuss the project, um, but that will be considered a portion of item number six, the presentation by the applicant, but we will add time for that, just so others are aware. Um, so with that in mind, the public hearing ground rules before the before opening the comprehensive permit for Thorndike Place, I want to take a minute to review some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request that the members of the board in consultation with our outside counsel and consultant ask what questions they have on the information that has been presented. After the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting to public comment. Public questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Due to previously demonstrated interest in this project and to provide an orderly flow to the meeting, the chair will limit individual public speakers to three minutes each. Please note that there will be multiple hearings for this project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. The chair also encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. The chair will first ask members of the public who have previously identified themselves by logging in through Zoom who wish to speak to digitally raise their hand using the controls in the Zoom application. You will be called upon by the meeting host, your audio and video will be unmuted, and you'll be asked to give your name and address, and you will be given three minutes for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. If there are those who are attending via phone, you can dial star nine, and that will raise the hand, your hand as well. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the allocated time has been expended, the public comment period for this evening's hearing will be closed. As noted previously, there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project, and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. The board and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. If you have a specific document to be pulled up during your comment, please ask us to do so. The board will then discuss topics for the upcoming hearing and proposed and uh, proposed continuance to a date certain. So the, that brings us to item number four, which is a discussion as the status of the 180 day hearing schedule. Um, <clears throat> I can ask uh, uh, John Witten to um, if he has a sense as to where what that date should be as of today. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, can you hear me okay, Mr. Chairman? I can, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, the 180 day period begins at the opening of the public hearing. And the question before the board is, when did this public hearing open in terms of substantive presentations? The last meeting of this matter was an introduction to the board from the applicant's council of the new team that the applicant had assembled for this project. There, I was present, as were the board members, there was no substantive information provided to the board. It was an introduction. Mr. Wade, I'm sorry, we're losing you. Mr. Chairman, is, is that any better? I'm... Yes, it is. Thank you. Sure. So where I, where I think I was, Mr. Chairman, when, when I got lost there was at the last meeting of the board where this matter came up, counsel for the applicants made a presentation by introducing the team to the board. There were no substantive matters discussed or presented to the board. Okay. And there were no plans. There were no details. There was no sense of what the project was rather an introduction. So in my opinion, the public hearing starts this evening and that would start the 180 day clock. Okay. Now the board's agenda makes it clear that the board is not necessarily gonna use those 180 days. And I think that should be a good signal to the applicant. But in terms of how the regulatory process works, 
in my opinion, the 180 day period begins this evening. Okay. Um, no, okay. Um, I'd like to address a question to Ms. Kiefer if she agrees with that assessment. I will uh, promote Ms. Kiefer to a uh, panelist so that she can um, address the matter. And if there's anyone Ms. Kiefer would like me to uh, promote to panelists along with her, I'll let her uh, state, so state. Ms. Kiefer, can you uh, hear us? I hear you. Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Yes. Okay. It doesn't yeah. appear that my video is coming through, though. Um, if that's okay with you. Let me see. Would you, would, you, um, would you like to start video, Ms. Kiefer? Uh, we don't need to at this time. I think you saw some preliminary information, but um, I will respond to what Attorney Witten um, stated. And he had stated that his interpretation was that the 180 days um, would start this evening. Um, that's not correct under the uh, 40B regulations. Um, so I disagree with that. However, I think it's a disagreement without difference, um, Mr. Chairman, um, because the, the, the first public hearing on this actually was, was back in uh, October of 2016. Um, and under the regulations, you're required to start that. But then we had the pause and then um, we came back. But I think that, um, you know, with the, um, the matter being remanded back to the board and then with the COVID-19, um, it's our opinion that we are, we are fine with agreeing to start 180 days today or having a 180 day period run from today. Um, I'm not waiting on my right that the hearing did open on this project back in October of 2016. So I'm not um, agreeing with Mr. Witten on that. But as I said, for the purposes of scheduling and moving forward on this, um, we are absolutely fine with um, if the board wants to start the 180 day clock from today. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions on this from the board? Okay, seeing none. Um, I'd like to just have the board vote to accept that uh, today, Tuesday, <clears throat> excuse me, August 25th, will be considered day one um, on the 180 day clock. Uh, we have a second. Second. Okay. Um, and then I will go and ask uh, specifically for votes. Um, so, Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Aye. Mr. Mills? Oh, you're on mute, Mr. Mills. Sorry. Aye. Right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Uh, Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes ayes. Thank you all for that. Um, that brings us to item number five. The discussion is the completeness of the application before the board. Um, so again, I will turn to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to Mr. Witten on this. Um, and we're trying to sort of ascertain uh, what documentation we would still have, still be expecting to receive and then to confer with counsel for the applicant um, as to the, the status of those documents or whether um, the documents we have to date are the final documents in those regards. Uh, so Mr. Witten. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Mr. Chairman, uh, on September 26th, 2016, I prepared a completeness memo for the board. I updated that memo dated July 7th, 2020 and used the same format. So an area of incompleteness from 2016, <laughs> if it remained incomplete in 2020, I made that note. If it was fixed in terms of the material being provided, uh, I made that note. So if the board has that 2000, uh, July 7, 2020 memo, you'll note that there still is a significant amount of materials missing uh, pursuant to your own regulations. And really, Mr. Chairman, at, at issue is what, what is the board gonna do about it? Um, the applicant has an obligation under the regs to provide the information required under the regs. But the question that comes up all the time is, well, what happens if they don't or refuse to? And the board, uh, unfortunately, is, is 
even in a sense in a game of chicken with the applicants because the board in in my opinion should not suspend its hearing the board should continue to press the applicant to produce the information that it's required to produce so the board can make a substantive decision so what i'd recommend mr chairman is as just as you said if the applicant would address the memo uh, dated July 7th, 2020, and identify the materials that the board will be receiving to complete the completeness review. And if the applicant refuses to produce that information, it would be a lot easier for everyone if they would identify that now, so that three months from now, the board isn't still pushing them to produce information that they simply refuse to, to produce. Mr. Klein, you're muted. Thank you, Mr. Heim. Uh, Ms. Keeper, um, you're in receipt of the, the July 7th memorandum? I, I am in receipt of it. Um, and, um, you know, it, it appears that the board should also have in its possession the March 18th, 2020 response to the completeness review. And we if you compare well. Mr. Witten's June 7th memorandum to the March 18th, you will see that there's a, a number of uh, pieces of information that Mr. Whitten, quite frankly, is, is glossing over. Um, if you want me to walk through this piece by piece, I gladly will with you right now. Um, if you look at his, his first comments um, relative to um, project eligibility requirements, um, Mass Housing issued a project eligibility letter on December 4th, 2015. Mm -hmm. And the definition of a project eligibility means that a determination by the subsidizing agency that a project satisfies the jurisdictional requirements of 56.04. That's the definition under 760 CMR 56.02. 56.04 goes on to say that compliance with project eligibility shall be established by the project eligibility letter. So Mr. Witten's first comment there that's incomplete that we haven't established project eligibility is patently in contrast to what the regulations provide. Okay. Going on from there. Um, Mr. Limited, Chairman, would it, would it be helpful to, to settle these issues once and for all? Mr. Um, Chairman, if I may, it is an irrebuttable presumption the regulations state. I, Mr. I think Mr. that... Mr. Chairman, would it, would it be perhaps helpful just to allow me to respond to Attorney Kiefer's comment, and then the board can move on. Yeah, I am trying to keep the <clears throat> the pace of this um, from going too long, um, and to necessarily address each and in, each individual point. Um, for for the purposes of of our review and going forward, um, to to my mind, what's most important is is the is not is the sort of the documentation that we're going to need to draw upon to uh, review the merits of the project. Um, and so, perhaps right now, if we could skip over the issues about um, eligibility documentation and such, um, and move on to um, the documentation that we have received to date um, in regards to the project plans themselves. Um, so going by uh, Mr. Witten's um, memorandum, so his page three, the preliminary site development plans. So we were, we were in receipt of revised plans from April of this year. Um, and are those the the final set of plans that are being submitted on behalf of the applicant? Uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, those, those are the revised plans that were submitted in March of, of 2020. Oh, thank you, March, yes, thank you. Correct, right, so BSC, um, prepared a set of site plans submitted in March of 2020. Um, to say that are those the final site plans? Um, no, th those aren't the final site plans. Because obviously within this process, your review um, moves forward and comments are made, um, you know, as initial comments have been made by data and, and things get refined and tweaked and whatnot. So um, the March 26, 2020 
plans are the are the most current plans, but they're they're not going to be the final plans, obviously, because there will be adjustments within the peer review process. Um, and and Mr. Witten's comments vis-a-vis -vis the preliminary site plans is largely it's unclear. He references that I don't know, a number of times. It's unclear, um, and I think that I would position that that is something that. Um, is very is the very role of peer review and what beta will, is doing and will continue to be doing to assist the board is to review the uh, the plans that are submitted and, and point out um, you know concerns that they may have or, or questions about clarity what whatnot um, I, I does that address your your inquiry there I believe so yes um, and we can I think you um, you and your clients can address this a little during the presentation this evening, but what I what I would like to try to get towards is an understanding of what documentation um, is currently un under revision, um, and what documentation we have that's sort of in a in a more complete format, so that as we when we get to the end of the hearing this evening and we're discussing upcoming dates, um, that we can set those dates. Um, to align with the information we have. And if there's are some topics that uh, the applicant would like additional time to address some of the submitted comments from um, the peer review engineers that we can allocate that time. Okay, very good. Um, so just continuing along the, um, the, mem the July 7th memorandum, uh, the existing, uh, Existing site conditions, I know we have information on that. Um, the scaled architectural drawings, um, which I think that we will probably hear more from the applicant specifically to that point. Um, uh, it's a question about additional information on the utility plans, um, the open space, and um, the list of requested exemptions. Um, and then um, I do have a question about the traffic impact report. So we did not receive an updated traffic impact report. The report we have is from 2014. Um, will that be revised? Yes, um, you're, you are correct that the, the traffic report that you have right now is, is the original 2014 report. And um, we will be revising it. And um, I don't want to, um, you know, um, misstate anything that Scott Thornton, who is our traffic engineer, is going to speak to this evening. But, um, I, you know, there's some unique circumstances, if you will, right now in terms of uh, doing a traffic report during COVID. And so he, uh, you know, he's going to be working with Beta um, and he will, um, again, Scott will probably better explain this in his presentation, but um, working with with data to um, determine what is the uh, you know the most appropriate methodology to move forward on this, and so and and it, it will be updated. Yes. Okay. Um, then there are other documents, um, really specifically to the application. Um, so Mr. Witten, are there specific items um, that you have noted in your completeness review that we should um, pay special attention to? Well, I, I think Mr. Chairman, you know, the purpose of the board's regulations are to ensure compliance with the regulations. Uh, the board spent a lot of time adopting those regs via public hearing. They have the force of law and unless the board is requested to waive those regulations, they are a requirement for filing with the Board of Appeals. Okay. So, you, you know, again, at this point, the, the board is faced with this game of chicken problem. Um, for example, a 2014 traffic study in 2020 really makes no sense. So the question is, when will the applicant produce the updated traffic study? Attorney Kiefer said it's coming, but the board doesn't have it. And that means the public doesn't have it. And that means the board's peer reviews reviewers don't have it. So I think they're all important, some things more than others, Mr. Chairman, uh, but, but I think the board, it's up to the board to 
determine which ones you should push back on. I think the traffic study and the site plans are the most important. Uh, Attorney Keeper's statement that the site plans are up to date relative to, to where we are in the process. Um, so that means the board can send those out for peer review and have a substantive discussion about it. But, but you can't do that with material you don't have. So I, I think the architectural issues, site mm -hmm. design, open space preservation, and the substantive issues related to the traffic study are things uh, that the applicant really needs to submit to the board promptly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Kiefer, if you're, um, if during the presentation, if the, if your client can sort of help to clarify when um, uh, these, these documents could be forthcoming, that would be, that would be helpful. Yes, and, and actually, uh, Chairman Klein, this, this dovetails into um, what we um, presume would probably be a discussion point near the end of the evening, um, and that would be talking about topical hearings and scheduling out future topical hearings, um, because generally the, the, way this, the way a smooth 40B works is that hearings are dedicated to a specific topic, and so all of the like, supplemental materials and response documents on that topic are submitted to the board in advance of that topical hearing. Um, right. um, and, and that's what we, uh, Chairman Quinn had previously proposed that back in December, um, and that schedule with COVID kind of blew apart, obviously. Um, but we would like to uh, work with you and the board to get those scheduling back on. And then what would be relevant to the upcoming topical hearing would be submitted in advance. Um, and again, I, I had discussed this briefly with, with um, Attorney Heim earlier this week, but um, back in December, Chairman Klein had asked for a 30-day advance filing. Um, and to keep us on a, on a tighter schedule, 30-day advance filing really kind of makes a, the hearing process longer, if you will, because you need the lead of time to do it and then that 30 days. Um, and we would um, ask the board to consider something shorter perhaps along the lines of like 15 days, two weeks or, or, or whatnot. Um, again, I don't know, if, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but sure. um, that was part of what we wanted to um, get out of this evening's hearing with the board is to arrange for um, future topical hearings and then um, make a determination when that timing would be. Um, my suggestion, and, I, and I'll let my, time, my team weigh in um, when we do our full presentation, but my suggestion would be probably the next hearing um, continued site design slash wetlands from there move on to traffic um, and, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, we'll come, we'll come back to that right. um, at, the, at the conclusion of the hearing this evening. Um, Mr. Thanks. Chairman? Yes. Could I, let me just add if I could, Mr. Chairman. So the, the board's agenda does outline those substantive hearings as mm -hmm. Attorney Kiefer has suggested. Uh, the board can move those around as you see fit. But I think there's an important difference between submitting materials 15 days or 30 days in advance of a hearing and compliance with the board's regulations. Those are very different things. The regulations require compliance by the submission of materials at the time of application. That is different than submitting iterative material during the course of these public hearings, which happens all the time, sufficiently in advance so the board can digest it and have the public have a chance to look at it. The two are not the same. This applicant has not complied with the board's regulations, and that is the issue that the chairman has raised. Mm -hmm. That is different than the applicant providing material to the board in advance of these substantive public hearings in a timely manner. And I don't think anyone's disputing that the applicant's going to try to do that, but that is a different conversation than the, the one that the chair has opened with. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, the, the applicant's application um, did comport with the 40B regulations um, and, and what, it, what an application should be. Um, and it also did seek a waiver of certain additional requirements that are in your local regulations. Um, and within our submission, as well as within our, our response from March, um, we've indicated that um, we're willing to, and we intend to update information. So I, I think for Attorney Witten to paint this as a picture is that we've just ignored your regulations. That's not the case. 
um, we've submitted an application that includes the requirements as required under the 40B regulations. And to the extent that your regulations may require additional information, um, we have said that we will provide that um, within a timely process. I mean, certain of the information, quite frankly, is um, it, it's at a level of detail that you don't get until you're further into a 40B process because it would just, you would have to keep redoing the same thing, which doesn't serve, frankly, the board or the applicant. Um, and just the one, um, the one point probably that we've taken issue with, direct issue with, with the board's regulations is to ask for a, a pro forma. Um, the regulations under 40B state that local boards can, can enact local filing requirements so long as they're not inconsistent with the 40B and 40B regulations. And the 40B regulations are very clear as to when and at what point in the hearing a board can, can seek to review pro forma review. And that's, that's just a matter of state law. So it's, it's not the applicant trying to be cute by any means, but it's just a matter of that's what the regulations say. That's what the case law under the regulations say. Mr. Chairman, I, I'll just respond very quickly. That's that's completely incorrect and and inappropriate. And then the board the board needs to hear the, the the truth, which is the board can require the pro forma. The board has the right to require the pro forma. The board's review of the pro forma will be toward the very end of this process. That's what the regs say. That's what the regulations say, and that's what the board's agenda tonight makes quite clear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would just refer the board to the regulations themselves. Um, I think that you're all very competent and capable of human beings, so um, you can read them and draw your own conclusions. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. It's me. Christian, I can't. Mr. Chairman, your audio isn't working at the moment. Uh, Looks like Mr. Hanlon wants to uh, make a point. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, the, I wanted to sort of make two related points. One is this whole proceeding is going to be an iterative process of getting more and more information. And the back and forth that we've had for the past five or 10 minutes is exactly what I think the chairman was trying to avoid earlier on. Uh, we, we could take up our whole time tonight with that sort of thing. And I don't, I don't think it will be particularly helpful. Uh, on the other hand, we do have some peer review reports already. Uh, and focusing just on the site plan one, uh, the theme that runs through it is that the peer review people who are, have had a chance to review the filing in March uh, have said over and over again that they don't have the information that they need to do the review that they want. And at this point, to be put in a position where we are not to worry that we'll have all of this updated 15 days before the hearing is not very comforting. Uh, so there is a reason for getting a little bit more front loading of information because otherwise, we always put our peer review people in a situation where the time is excessively short for them and they're always trying to catch up. And at the end of the day, they're going to say, well, something wasn't clear. We didn't have this information and we didn't have that information. And the answer will end up being too bad. So I think that we need to concentrate more than uh, Ms. Kiefer has suggested on getting this information in a, in a timely way. Uh, I think that if we were to do the wetlands impact and stormwater management in September, as I think that she suggested, uh, that the ability of the keepers people to provide the information that Veda has asked for uh, even 15 days, much less 30 days before uh, that, before September 22nd, uh, is almost an impossible task. So. Uh, I'd like it, it without worrying too much about whether we are going to stand on compliance with regulations, I'd like to have a useful discussion of how we are going to get the information that the uh, peer group be that Beta has asked for in sufficient time for them to respond to it and for us to have a productive hearing. Thank you. Um, can you hear me now? Mr. Klein, your audio is um, just a little weak. Oh, 
I can hear you, but just barely. I don't know if other folks are having the same experience. It seems they are. Is that any better? Yes. Much better, sir. Much better, okay. Very good. Um, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so it's, I'd, I'd like to pick that up um, as we discuss the schedule um, <clears throat> for, the, for the subsequent and substantive hearings. Um, so we can proceed. Uh, so at this time, I would like to ask um, the applicant if um, they're prepared to make their, their uh, presentation. We are, Mr. Chairman. Um, could At this time, could we have um, Attorney Hine promote the project team um, as panelists? So that would be uh, Gwen Noyes, Arthur Klipfel, John Hessian, Scott Thornton, and Bob Angler. I will do that. And as folks are um, promoted, um, you'll be given the option to turn on your video so that folks can see you. And uh, if you're going to engage in any screen sharing so that they can also um, have a better picture of your screen. Hold on one moment. Mr. Engler. It's noise. Miss Kiefer, I'm sorry. Uh, what's the, uh, I'm trying to find uh, Arthur. What's the uh, last name associated with the account? It's, uh, it would be clip file. Thank you. Not seeing uh, Mr. Clipfell on this list. He might be using a... He, he may be with Ms. Noise. So they, they may, I don't know if you have audio up of them yet. Check on that. There is one that's labeled and Arthur Clipfell that's up on the screen at the moment. Okay. Glenn, Art, I'm trying to unmute you there. Uh, let me. Um, Trying to get your video started as well. And uh, Miss uh, Kiefer, you said that there's uh, someone here from BSC? Yes, John Hessian. John, you're on. Mr. Engler is there. Uh, Gwen and Art, it looks like you're on the same account. Are you on the phone? Because I don't see the option to uh, provide video for you. We are, we are on the same phone, yes. You're on, you're on the, the telephone? Well, we're on the... Uh, we're on the video. The, 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 mute, the, the uh, audio of the, uh, of the Zoom. Okay. Is that everybody? Ms. Kiefer, am I missing anybody from the team? Um, I... Should have Mr. Engler, Mr. Hessian, uh, Gwen, and Art on a mutual account. Okay, you're missing Scott Thornton then. Okay. Not doing anybody's 
All right, Mr. Thornton, there you are. I think that's what transition. So Gwen and Art, just as a heads up, your video is, it doesn't appear to be working. Um, it's turned on, but it's not uh, working. And Ms. Kiefer, do you want your video on? You can turn my video on, that's fine, thank you. I'm not sure why it isn't. I, I, I've done everything I can. <laughs> we'll go to start video. Start my video. That maybe that's it. Now, now we're at now. Chairman, it looks like everybody's present. Oh, Mr. Chairman, you're muted. Here you go. Is there, um, Ms. Keeper, who would like to take control of the screen for the presentation? Uh, in terms of the presentation, I, I think that uh, John Hessian will um, will have the uh, the the, uh, the visual. Okay. Do you want to go ahead and proceed? Okay. Very good. Um, Again, okay. good evening, Chairman Klein and members of the board. I, uh, oh, one moment, please. Has everybody seen the introductory slide? R. Yes, yes. Um, again, so, so good evening, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, my name is Stephanie Kiefer, and I am an attorney with the law firm of Smolak and Vaughn in North Andover. Um, our firm um, has worked on a, a number of 40B projects throughout the Commonwealth for both limited dividend entities, um, nonprofits, and, and also some consulting with um, municipalities. This evening, we're here before you um, on behalf of Arlington Land Realty. And um, we are pleased to continue with the public hearing process on the comprehensive permit application for Thornbed Place. Uh, this evening we have with us, uh, you will hear from shortly, Gwen Noyes and Arthur Klipfell um, from Oak Tree Greenstacks, um, as well as our project engineer, John Hessian from the BSC Group, um, Scott Thornton of Vanessa and Associates, our traffic engineer, and last but not least, Robert Angler from SEB, our 40B housing consultant. And as, as we previously in the introductory discussions on this, um, we recognize that this project proposal has been previously presented to the ZBA initially back in October 2016. Um, at that time, uh, for the members of the board that weren't members of the board back in 2016, um, the hearing opened and, and the zoning board sought to invoke the general land area minimum safe harbor um, at that time. Um, in response to the board's notification of its efforts to invoke the safe harbor, um, we had asked for review by the Department of Housing and Community Development in accordance with the 40B regulations. Uh, the DHCD reviewed the safe harbor claim and um, determined that it had not been established. From there, the board then filed the appeal with the Housing Appeals Committee, which um, lasted for quite an extensive amount of time, but by late last fall, the Housing Appeals Committee issued its determination that the town had not established that it was um, able to um, assume a safe harbor under the general land, land area minimum, and it remanded the matter back to the board, um, which basically brought us to last December. Um, as Attorney Witten had referenced, we had a, a cursory um, introductory, we introduced the new members of the project team now that the Housing Appeals Committee had definitively decided that we had a viable project to present before the board, um, that there was no safe harbor available to Arlington. Um, and the new members of the team that we introduced are, are here tonight as well. And they were John Hessian uh, from the BSC group and Scott Thornton from Vanessa and Associates, our, our, our traffic engineer. Um, likewise, within that, December 26th or December 2019, excuse me, um, public hearing. We um, gave an overview of the project and also explained that um, we were going to, um, BSC wanted to go back, uh, update the, uh, the 
the survey of the property and the wetlands um, and that we would be submitting updated uh, our civil plans and then corresponding architectural plans. Um, and it was agreed at that point that the hearing would be continued until April. And so the submission date would be March. So in March of 2020, um, the applicant submitted updated BSC plans, updated architectural plans, um, a response to the completeness review, an updated waiver list. Um, and I, I don't think I'm missing anything else. Um, and then of course, we were in April um, with COVID and, and basically no public hearings were going forward. The, the board and the applicant agreed to continue the public hearing until June, um, but at June, the, the town had not, um, had, had not had sufficient time for its peer review consultants, the beta group, to review the updated site plans. Um, we thought that that was gonna come in in July, and as of early August, um, beta, we were provided beta's peer review of the site engineer, uh, site, the site plans, um, and probably a week earlier of the, its, its review of the, the 2014 traffic survey. Um, so under that um, history, if you will, procedurally, um, there was a significant time lapse. And, and as I said, the board's composition has changed. We have a new chairman. Um, and our goal for this evening is to reintroduce the project with an overview of the type of development, the design concepts, the amenities, um, including the benefits of the community as a whole, and um, and to then, add, and from there, as we suggested, take any questions that the board or the may have, um, or its peer review, um, allow for public comment, and then to work forward on scheduling the topical hearings. Um, and, and probably within the individual um, professional review or presentations this evening, BSC, um, Vanessa, um, they're going to probably weigh in on, on how they see the topical hearings and, and um, what they would want for additional timing and, and for scheduling. Um, and so um, with that somewhat of a housekeeping matter, um, I'm going to give a brief overview of the project for the board and, and for the uh, community. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Gwen Noyes to discuss the planning and design um, who will then give a brief presentation and turn it over to BSC John Hessian for the, the civil review um, and then from traffic. And then, as I said, we'll, um, we're happy to answer any questions that the board or the peer review may have. Um, just as a quick overview of the project, um, the property itself is off of Route 2 and it consists of 17 plus acres um, and, and is located between Dorothy and Birch Street and, and Route 2 to the south. And the abutting neighborhood um, off Dorothy Street, it's a primarily residential neighborhood um, featuring single family homes, modestly sized lots. And ALR's presentation, as you've, you've seen on the plans and we'll revisit this evening, um, the, we propose a development where the, um, the portion of the site closest to Dorothy Road um, would consist of six townhouses, two dwelling units in each one, um, uh, two-story and so the intent there is that that serves as a transition from the residential neighborhood to the um, to the um, the multifamily apartment building that's going to be behind these six townhouses and that multifamily structure is it's it's broken out so it's not just one monolithic building but it has a, a west wing which is l-shaped and then an east wing that has a jog in it um, and that will be four four stories um, but again, it's set back farther from the road. So the, the view from the road is you see these townhouses and then behind it, um, you, you see the, uh, the apartment building. And as I stated, the majority of the site is not going to be developed. It is, the development I believe is somewhere between five and six acres of the 17.7 .7 acre site, um, which allows for the, the balance of, of the property to remain open space. Um, and in part of our design considerations in terms of how to um, get the project on the site and, and to keep open space, um, there's also parking that's going to be provided. There's some surf, surface parking, but there's also parking that's underneath the buildings, which 
Um, we provided, I believe, the total count of parking spaces is 304 parking spaces. Um, and that was specifically to make certain that there's no risk of parking on the neighborhood streets. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we can work with the board of the peer review if they you know, want to talk about less parking or whatnot. But again, I think that's a topic for another hearing. And so somewhat without further ado, I'm going to pass over the presentation now to Gwen Noyes um, to give you the kind of the, the planning and design overview of the project. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your um, service to the community and, and being members of the ZBA uh, board. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, so uh, Stephanie has given a certain amount of the overview. Uh, if you want to switch to the uh, site plan, please, John. Thank you. Um, this is the original site plan that we that we proposed and uh, because the architectural and s uh, scale of it was not something that, that was uh, problematic with the housing court we have um, uh, largely brought back the same uh, architectural plan uh, site plan that we originally proposed uh, and uh, we've made some site modifications to it uh, to reflect the, the uh, further investigations that was that were done by our engineer John Hessian and his company BSC, uh, but but to a, a very large extent this is still the same plan. Um, we uh, really would like to emphasize how much open land is saved uh, of the property. We think it's between ten and eleven when we're by the time we're done ten and eleven acres, which is. Uh, considerably larger than the Thorndike Park, which is right beside it, and would be a, a big addition. Um, the the plan would uh, also have paths running through it, and uh, not the configuration shown here, but John's uh, plan forthcoming will, will uh, show some adjustments that we've made. But basically, the paths would be uh, allowing uh, easy access to the LY station as well as um uh pleasure uh, you know walks through the a concert conservation land that would be uh considerably different from the way it is right now it's just it would be open to the public clearly and and uh, a safe place to go um, as well as being a good connection to the <clears throat> alewife station um so we imagine it would be a community asset for of the whole community, you know, the whole neighborhood as well as the, t the town. Um, and this plan does indicate, um, you can see the, the, the six townhouses at the top of the plan that um, are basically the same scale as the existing homes along the street on Dorothy Road. And this is uh, meant to be, as, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, a transition from what the streetscape is uh, now to uh, to the uh, plan where there be higher buildings in the back. And you can see in this uh, very accurately uh, constructed uh, rendering, perspective rendering, it shows how the townhouses along Dorothy Road um, really do screen a larger building behind it. The four-story building behind it would be uh, barely visible, and of course, we're showing small trees here. So that is one of the major aspects of the site plan that we have planned from the from the beginning. Um, so, uh, as mentioned by uh, by Stephanie Kiefer, the parking. We can go to the next slide. Um, it would be under the buildings. Uh, they're not shown here, obviously, but there's four stories above. Well, we okay. There's the parking, um, and so the uh, required number of parking, which may be adjusted according to uh, more recent studies that, that that the town and perhaps Beta have done in terms of what is needed. But um, we we provided I think 304 spaces as per the per the zoning requirement here, um, and most of it was under the under the building. Some of it on the site. Um, so, uh, 
the uh, entire project would be built uh, with modules. That is a, a very big piece of the work that we do. And we believe it uh, does a number of things for the community besides being very high quality construction and, um, and energy efficient and, and so on. Uh, it means that the, the length of time that a construction site is, uh, is, is causing neighborhood disruption is much diminished. So this is, this is something that uh, uh, we, we would like to make clear to the community that it would be a, a real asset in terms of the construction. Um, Ms. Noyes, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I've got a request for some folks to make this a little bit bigger. Uh, Mr. Hessian, is there any way that uh, we can just focus on a single slide? If we're going to focus on the slide, maybe we should go back to this, the site plan. Sure. Are you, are you seeing more than one slide? No, we're just seeing the parking slide right now, but it's... Oh. So I'm seeing a, the, the, the sort of slide as well as something that says next slide. Um, we got some folks asking to change the display setting so that um, it's in the um, get rid of the presenter view. Does that make sense, John? Um, I'll try. Okay. Maybe the magnifying glass? Hide presenter view? There we go. That's bigger. So if I do from beginning. Okay. I'll try that out. Oops. Just has the wrong date on it, that's all. <laughs> okay. So we go back to. Go, go back to, um, uh, let's see, um, I think the, Okay, next slide after that. You see in the perspective? We've talked about that a little bit. The next slide after that. Um, well, this, this is showing the four-story buildings that, that are actually, you'd never see them this way because they'd be screened by the townhouses and trees and so on, but it, it does give the, the, um, a little bit of the scale. And of course, this was designed five years ago and um, as we say, we do, we're doing module and we're, we're all, always improving. So this is something that, uh, um, you know, might look a little different, but and, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is showing that again, the scale of the, so of the townhouses. Be that, as well. And these would be modular also um, uh, with parking so below the, and, the street would be clear and uh, the, the parking would be off street. So, um, and they would, they could have a different colors and, and look to them, but it's, this is just to, to indicate what we were uh, presuming would be a, a pleasant way for Dorothy uh, Road to, to end rather than uh, with a, uh, a larger scale building. So, next slide. Um, and this was showing, the, the, again, the parking underneath and uh, John, I believe there was a one slide that had the uh, the um, section through the whole site, like showing both the townhouses and the and the four story buildings. Is that do you still have that in your in your deck? We we moved that to the reference drawings, but I can call it up here. Me too. Okay. This is this is illustrating the same point that the on the left are the an existing and then the new town uh, townhouses and then uh, you can see there's there's uh, some uh, planting in between and the four story building that then goes off to the right and and that would goes you know then the woods go out to route two so uh, this is a, a, a an overview of how we would accomplish the 219 uh, apartments um, uh, 12 of them being townhouses, but most of them being uh, two bedrooms and uh, ones and two bedrooms and three bedroom apartments. And uh, they would, 75% of them would be market rate, 25% affordable. And uh, we, we have heard over and over again uh, that, that, that there's a crying need for senior housing. And this is housing that, uh, you know, is a short walk to, 
to uh, alewife and, and fresh palm. So um, I think this is an overview, uh, and I would uh, like to say that the uh, as the housing court has basically said that that this this uh, plan conforms to what they uh, see as 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 a as a good as a good place to, to continue working. The major issue that we had with uh, the community had to do with the concerns for uh, the wetlands and the, and the civil engineering aspects. And we brought in a BSC group, a highly esteemed Boston civil engineering operation. And uh, John Hessian is going to continue uh, the presentation and we're very grateful for his expertise. He's, he's a senior partner of BSC and um, has has a lot of good experience to to bring to this effort. So, John, you're 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 on. Thank you, Gwen. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, my name is John Hessian. I'm a civil engineer with the BSC Group, located at 803 Summer Street in Boston. And before I get going here, I want to try to get the presentation back. Um, I don't know if I messed up the view um, that everyone's seen. Are you seeing the civil and wetland resources title slide? No. Yes. Yeah, you are. No, okay. Right now, yes. Okay. Are you seeing the whole deck on the on the left or yeah. just the title? You are. So let me see if I can. Uh... We're seeing uh, five slides as a deck after the uh, intro. For some reason, switching it from presenter view, um, I can't get, it seems like I can't get it back to. Uh, it's a big, it's a big picture that I think. The full screen, see. okay. So, um, you know, it, it's good to be back. The last time I was before this board or, or the last version of this board was back on December 10th. Um, and at that time, you know, I, I, I identified what my charge was from the applicant here. Um, many of the comments and um, from the original application were questions about the accuracy of the survey, the floodplain, the wetlands delineation at that time was about um, six years old. It was done and completed in uh, 2009. Um, a lot of the plans were comments were that they were illegible, not scalable, missing information. So my charge was to create um, good, accurate, complete data to kind of re restart this project. So um, since that December 10th hearing, we've completed an updated survey for the property, including the boundary, existing topography at one foot contour intervals. Um, and that survey was completed in December 2019 and, and January 2020 over that two month period. Um, as I mentioned, the, um, the, one of the concerns with the original survey was that it was done on a different vertical datum than the FEMA um, flood insurance rate maps. So our updated survey has been completed on the NAVD 88 vertical datum, which is consistent with the FEMA flood insurance rate maps. Um, the 100 year floodplain elevation for this site is elevation 6.8. And it's shown as the very kind of squiggly uh, orange line at the more towards the Dorothy Road end of the site, the northern end of the site. Um, we've also shown the FEMA floodway, which is the, um, the orange dash line that is closer to the southern end of the property. Um, both of those are taken directly from the FEMA um, documents. Um, so I believe, you know, that, that was one of the, you know, the big comments or questions originally was to have accurate floodplain information and accurate survey. I think we've accomplished that in that in that time frame. Um, also during that time frame, you know, BSC wetland scientists conducted a wetland delineation 
And as you may recall, um, we had had an early winter snowstorm just prior to that December 10th hearing. Um, and clearly we had to wait, our wetland scientists had to wait for a, a winter thaw um, to conduct the, the wetland delineation. And that, that thaw actually occurred on January 15th. Um, and that's the date that the delineation was completed. But, you know, given the time of year, um, January is not ideal for wetland delineation, but given the timing of the remand back from the Housing Appeals Committee, um, that's kind of the hand that we were dealt. But because of that, we sent two of our most highly regarded wetland scientists out as a, as a team to do this delineation. Jillian Davies is a senior ecological and soil scientist and Marley Sullivan, who has um, specific experience or expertise in field identification of both upland and wetland plants. Um, you know, on the, the, the exhibit that's on the screen before you, um, you'll see two dashed blue lines or, or various dashed blue lines. Those represent the 2020 and the 2009 wetland delineations. And we provided that information um, on our updated environmental resources plan for comparison because um, it, we found it interesting, I guess, that the 2020 delineation was very consistent with the 2009 delineation. However, you know, due to the winter conditions, um, you know, for completing the, the 2020 updated delineation and for the planning and design purposes for these revised plans, we use the more, you know, upgradient or conservative of the two 2009 or 2020 delineations for establishing the buffers and setbacks that you see in white in the the, the closer line is the 20, the, the town's local bylaw, 25 foot, no disturbed zone. And the outer line is the 100 foot wetland buffer, consistent with uh, the Wetlands Protection Act, but also consistent with, you know, the town's local bylaw um, um, ARA uh, limits. So, you know, with, with what we believe is very good and accurate, you know, updated survey, floodplain, and wetland information, you know, we went forward and essentially recreated, as, as Gwen mentioned, we re recreated the original design from 2016 with some site plan revisions. Um, in particular, you know, based on the updated survey uh, and and building setbacks on the west, we um, we eliminated a walkway that was that ran down the um, the west side of the west wing building, and and actually it went behind the building through the 25 foot um, no disturbed zone. So we removed that to eliminate impacts, obviously on adjacent properties. Um, and to minimize impacts within the 25 foot no disturb zone. Um, ad additionally, we, uh, with Oak Tree, we modified the building. We, we modified both the west and east wings of the building just a bit. Um, previously, they had protruded into the, the 25 foot no disturb zone and on the east wing, essentially right on the, um, the bordering vegetated wetland limit. So um, Oak Tree worked with us and we, we modified those building corners a little bit to move them out of that, out of that resource area. Um, other revisions to the plans, I, I don't have them highlighted here, that, but that were completed uh, primarily in response to previous comments that were compiled back in 2016. Um, many of which are, were from uh, public works. We've eliminated the pervious uh, pavement over the, uh, the sewer easement near the Dorothy Road um, entrance, that little um, isolated parking lot, which is at the extreme west end of the project. 
uh, we have modified the proposed waterline loop. It entered the main site drive from Dorothy Road and originally looped back out um, through the emergency access to Parker Street. Uh, but there was a previous comment requesting that it be looped through to the uh, Burrich Edith, Edith Street intersection. We've incorporated that change. Um, we've connected or we've corrected the proposed sewer connections from the townhomes to the sanitary sewer in Dorothy Road. We've modified the sewer connection for the multifamily building, um, run the cross country easement sewer main to uh, the line in Dorothy Road, again, based on a previous comment. And we've shown the accessible parking spaces on the site, which are located uh, by the main entrance to the east wing. Um, you know, one change that we have not represented on the revised plans, or we did along the west and south of the west wing, where we eliminated the walkway, but, you know, the recreational trail, um, you know, it came up in a, in one of Beta's peer review comments, but it's clearly not the intention of this project to create additional wetland impacts with the creation of the trail network. This is envisioned to be an amenity for the future residents and for the neighbors. Um, and it, as people are aware, there is currently a significant homeless encampment on the property with an established network of paths. And our, our idea or our proposal actually, um, which we thought of after we submitted the revised plans, would be to walk the existing pathway network you know, with representatives from the town and the neighborhood and identify appropriate paths to be retained into the future um, and the others could be restored to their natural condition. Um, so clearly we would eliminate the wetland crossing. There was originally a boardwalk uh, wetland crossing proposed, uh, but that would minimize or, or eliminate any potential wetland impacts, wetland resource area impacts related to the, the recreational trail network um, and providing um, connections to the Minuteman bike path and to Alewife and, and to the park. Um, so um, I, guess, I guess I was gonna hop into, you know, Beta's peer review. You know, we are in receipt of Beta's peer review, which was dated August 5th. Um, you know, we are very happy that many of the 2015 Nova Armstrong comments have been addressed with these revised plans and this revised submission. Um, but with the current peer review letter, Beta's uh, review, is broken down into six general areas. The site plans, floodplain, stormwater management, utilities, construction, and environmental. Um, and we clearly, uh, as it's been mentioned you know, earlier in this presentation, we look forward to the opportunity to work with that data to provide you know, responses to all of their, their comments to date. Um, and just in general, um, you know, the site plan comments mostly relate to requests for additional information on the plans. Um, and as has been discussed, you know, that we fully expect that. Um, we didn't see anything in those requests that um, we see a, as a problem, but we just see it as that iterative process of, you know, a 40B application where additional information is provided, additional details. but you know, the information at the outset is maybe a little more preliminary so that the applicant isn't expending, you know, huge costs on full engineering design on something that may change through this public hearing process. Um, you know, the second uh, comments related to floodplain um, primarily relate to compensatory flood storage uh, for the proposed fill in the floodplain. We have you know, as part of our, you know, revised submission, we completed preliminary calculations um, for that compensatory storage, and we will update and provide, we will be able to update and provide that to beta. Um, I, I will mention that 
with our you know requests of waivers from the local wetlands bylaw we will be proposing that compensatory storage at a one to one ratio and not the um, Arlington uh, local wetland bylaw two to one compensatory storage ratio. Um, the third focus on Beta's comments was stormwater management. And again, I think similar to the site plans, um, their comments are looking for additional details and calculations showing compliance with the Massachusetts DEP stormwater management regulations. And we see that as a, a next phase of you know, working towards um, addressing those comments. Um, their utility comments were, I, I think, pretty minor in this, in this peer review letter. Um, and as I mentioned earlier with some of the plan revisions, several of the previous utility comments were addressed with this revised submission, but we completely agree with Beta's recommendation that we should coordinate with DPW on the proper utility um, connection locations and sizes to support this proposed development. Um, as far as you know, the construction, um, you know, as as Gwen mentioned, the proposed construction method using modules will greatly minimize construction period impacts and significantly reduce the duration of construction activities. And we could provide additional information on on that um, type of construction and and how and document how that will uh, impact reduce those impacts in the duration. Um, but in addition, this project will adhere to other town construction requirements, such as hours of operations. Um, and we'll provide that in our response to Beta's comments. Um, th their final category of comments uh, relates to environmental. Um, the comments identify the differences between the Wetlands Protection Act, uh, Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act, and the Arlington Wetlands Bylaw, including regulated areas and performance standards. As was identified in our uh, list of requested waivers, the applicant has requested an exemption from the local wetlands bylaw. Um, I think that has um, a, a, a pretty significant overarching um, uh, influence on our on our proposed responses or how we will respond or work with beta on their environmental comments. Um, so in that vein, it, it is important that we are able to work with beta um, first and foremost to confirm the wetland boundaries on the site. You know, our updated delineation from January. Um, you know, once the boundaries are confirmed, we can quantify the impacts of the proposed work, you know, uh, within the various Wetlands Protection Act and local bylaw regulated areas. Um, by doing this, it will help us identify, and I, I believe this is, you know, my interpretation of what Beta was looking for in several of their comments was, to identify the extent of relief that would be granted with the waiver of you know, some of the local wetland bylaws. Um, you know, with that, we look forward to working with Beta to provide the additional environmental information in addition to the other um, five comments. But I, I believe the environmental comments are you know, maybe the, the most critical to address um, closely with, with Beta um, a lot of other things are dependent on um, where those shake out. Um, and based on the tentative schedule that was outlined in tonight's agenda, the October 13th 20 and 27th dates for wetlands, stormwater, and civil engineering matters, um, you know, those dates, there, there should be adequate time to provide the additional information and work with data to respond to those comments and, and questions. Um, but you know, with that said, it sounds like we may be revisiting um, some of those proposed dates and topical hearings at the conclusion of um, tonight's meeting. But 
um, if those dates were to stick, I think that those are good dates for, for addressing those comments. Uh, with that, um, I'm obviously open for questions at the conclusion, but would like to now turn it over to Scott Thornton to discuss traffic. Okay, just a, a brief uh, note, Ms. Kiefer, we're, we're over the, the 30 minute time slot, so if you could encourage the team to um, try to keep it, keep it tight so we can uh, get this completed. Okay, very good. Um, Scott, if you're ready to present, I think his presentation will probably last just a few moments, a few minutes. Yes, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Scott Thornton. I'm with Vanessa and Associates, and uh, we're preparing the traffic assessment for the project. Um, given that we're short on time, I just want to want to go over uh, some aspects of the assessment. Um, you know, we intend on doing a thorough and complete analysis of the appropriate traffic conditions, both with and without the project, uh, to make sure that we accurately identify the project's impacts on traffic flow in the area. Um, there was a stand, there was a traffic assessment prepared for the project by another consultant in 2014. This study looked at the six locations that are shown on this slide, which range from uh, Route 2 and Route 16 intersection, Bellwright Brook Parkway, the location number one. Mr. Thornton, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is Doug Heim. Uh, I, Mr. Uh, Hessen, can you uh, stop your screen share uh, or alternatively bring the slide up again? I don't know if Mr. Thornton plans to refer to it, but the only thing the folks can see on the screen right now is, is Mr. Thornton. Oh, okay. I, I, can still see, I was going to say, I could still use that slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe that was my setting. My apologies, Mr. Thornton. That's fine. John, you want to try to pull up the slide again? Yeah. Okay. Is it oh, that's the whole thing. That's even better. Yeah, so uh, so we extend the, the study area uh, included ramp intersections uh, for Lake Street with Route 2 and extended along Lake Street, uh, looking at Little John Street, Birch Street, and then went out to the intersection with Mass Avenue. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going to be updating this study. Um, there are, um, obviously 2014 was a long time ago, and there have been comments that were received on the 2014 study that um, that we would be addressing in an update. Um, you know, we were anticipating collecting traffic counts in April of this year, and obviously now is not a is not an appropriate time to collect that data. We wanted to get counts when when the weather was better, so we would get good pedestrian and bicycle volumes. Uh, but then the pandemic hit. We we couldn't really do traffic counts in summer because in general that's not appropriate and we were hopeful that schools would be in session in person after labor day but it seems like in arlington distance learning will be in effect so you know there's there remains to be a bit of discussion um, to be had with uh, both the town's peer consultant for traffic and with the arlington traffic advisory committee regarding the base traffic conditions that we'll use for the study. Uh, John, if you could go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't want to move. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just move along. Um, we received comments from Beta earlier this month. Uh, they recommended a number of additional locations, including the Lake Avenue intersections with Brooks Ave and with the Minuteman Bikeway, which we think are totally appropriate. Uh, Brooks Ave in particular, that traffic signal we noticed uh, when we were, when I was down in December uh, prior to the to the previous hearing, uh, there, there seemed to be a lot of, um, a lot of queuing that occurred between Brooks Ave and Lake Street and no queuing between Brooks Ave and Mass Ave. So we thought that there might be some, some miscommunication going on with the signal equipment. That is something we wanna look at with DPW and with the, with the TAC. Um, we received some 
comments uh, from the TAC, um, both in regards to this year, and also they had, um, they had some comments from the 2014 study. Uh, the TAC had also indicated that they have uh, traffic counts or more recent traffic data than, uh, than what was used obviously in the 2014 study. So, so we plan to be in contact with them, coordinate with, with Beta and with TAC and with DPW on uh, updated information. Um, John, are we able to get to the, to the next slide or is that? Have you seen the recommendations and considerations? Yes. Okay. So I think in terms of, um, you know, recommendations uh, for the updated TIA, we, we plan to coordinate with beta on the study area and the methodology for the baseline traffic development. Uh, they had indicated uh, looking at Minuteman bikeway and the future proposed signalized control that's proposed for that intersection with Lake Ave. Uh, we're going to look at connections with the area multimodal facilities with the Minuteman bikeway uh, right in our backyard. Uh, we will also review the uh, parking considerations. Uh, it seems like the, the parking supply uh, is, is sort of a fluid number, but uh, we can absolutely look at that with, you know, in conjunction with the town's consultant. And, uh, you know, we, we have worked on uh, other residential developments in the area. So we have a good idea for what the modal split characteristics are of, of those developments. And, you know, we just uh, expect to uh, continue to work with the, um, with the town's departments and the peer consultant moving forward. In terms of timing and the topical hearings and the schedule for those, uh, we're hopeful that we can get a revised and updated uh, traffic study to beta sometime next month. Uh, then there's probably going to be some back and forth that will be necessary. Um, but we expect that, um, you know, to the extent that we can, we can try to um, address all of the concerns. We have a good base of information and comments to work with to shape the, the scope of the traffic study. And we're hopeful that we can start to meet either the, the middle of October or possibly the end of October hearings for the project. And that's all I have. Um, I'll turn it over to, I think, Bob Engler at this point. And thank you for your time. Bob Engler, I wasn't planning on any presentation, but only to respond to questions. With that said, um, I, I think that we would like to open it up if the board has any specific questions that they want to ask um, any of the project team. Um, and I don't know if, uh, Likewise, if Beta has any specific questions. Mr. Klein, I'm sorry, that's my fault. <laughs> Folks are still having a little trouble hearing you, Mr. Klein. Okay. Um, but I'll go ahead and uh, promote the, the Beta team, if you like. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I did have one question on the traffic study. I don't know if this is a possibility, but do traffic studies look at all uh, now in the realm of, uh, you know, Grubhub, Uber Eats, and Uber in general, are, are there any methodologies for determining um, expected trips from those type of activities that would be worked into a model? Yeah, so, so in, terms of, um, in terms of modal choice like that and the transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft, uh, we do have some data that shows um, um, uh, percentages of vehicle trips made uh, through uh, through those types of um, those types of um, uh, traffic choices. Um, there are generally two types 
of um, of the modes. There's there's traveling by yourself with an Uber or uh, traveling in a carpool arrangement with Uber. So we have some of that data and, and we expect that to be wrapped into the traffic study. So we'll have that information. We'll also have uh, expected users um, for transit, uh, for, for pedestrian, for bicycle modes as well. Um, are there more questions from the, from the board before I, I ask data for comments? Um, Mr. Hyman, Mr. just switch it back to the other mode so I can see hands. I can see Patrick. There you are. Mr. Hanlon. Sorry, the, uh, this is a transportation question. I, I, I think it's been asked in a lot of the chats as well, but, and maybe Beta can weigh in on this. Um, I don't really understand and I would like some education on how it is that anything, any studies that are being done in the next few weeks or even few months in the middle of the pandemic, when both transit and uh, automobile traffic is completely atypical of the past and of what we would expect in normal times. And when we have only the vaguest conception of what the new normal will be like, um, I don't see how you get from here to there, and I'm wondering how, what thinking you and, and I guess Beta have done to figure out how to make what you can do in the short term and in, in 2020 generally relevant to the decision that's before us. Right. So, and it's a, it's a great question, and um, we're not proposing to collect data now because uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's not appropriate. Traffic conditions are, are not the norm and, and likely will not be uh, for some time. But um, we're hopeful that we can use some historic traffic data uh, using the, um, the, uh, the policies and directives uh, that MassDOT has issued, in fact, uh, uh, for May of this year where they indicated that uh, typically there's, a, there's a, a one to two year window on using traffic data uh, for analysis. And uh, the directive has indicated that, that that window can be expanded within reason as long as the traffic count data meets uh, their uh, DOT's protocols. So we haven't yet had the discussion with the Traffic Advisory Committee but again, they had indicated that they have some other traffic data that is of a more uh, recent date than what was used in the 2014 study. And so what we're hopeful of is that we can use that data, maybe it's a couple years old for, for locations along Lake Ave and, um, and correct if it's, if it's say 2018 data, 2017 data, we could take that correct it upwards to 2020 conditions, assuming there was no uh, pandemic, and then project that into the, into the seven year horizon as we would do with, with a standard traffic study. And if Beta has any, has any additional comments, you know, uh, I'm sure you'd want to hear from them. Does Beta have any specific comments on the traffic study? I can I can reiterate what what Mr. Thornton is saying that you know as an industry we're looking at guidance typically we would look at data for data to be relevant we would expect it to be within a, about a two year window um, now we're expanding that window because we can't collect new data it wouldn't be meaningful um, data collected during the pandemic certainly data connected collected now would not be valid and so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that there might be some data that the TAC has and that um, that would be more recent than the 2014 data from the previous um, from the previous study for the site but something that can be extrapolated using guidance that the state has issued um, to adjust that based on known um, factors and so that would be useful in an updated study so it'll, it'll be a question of what 
what other data exists. So that's something that we recommended in our letter to look at sources for um, newer data that could be extrapolated using those um, state guidelines. Perfect, thank you. Are there other questions from the board that relate to traffic? Seeing none. Um, Mr. Heim, I was want to ask if you could uh, bring up Susan Chapnick. So, yes, Ms. Ms. Thank you. So Ms. Chapnick is the, uh, the chair of the Town of Arlington Conservation Commission, and she asked to, uh, to address this meeting, and so I asked her if she could address this during this time. Ms. Chapnick, uh, you're promoted to panelist. I'm just going to try to find your screen and give you the option to appear by video. Susan, can you hear us? Should be unmuted. Oh, no, nope, you're muted. Hold on one moment. Let me check to see if Susan's um, got a separate phone line because uh, it doesn't appear that it's coming through here. Hold on a moment. While we're waiting on that, are there other specific questions from beta group that they would like to, um, to address to the applicant? Hi, Mr. Chair, Marty Nova with the beta group. I don't have any questions okay. for the applicant at this time. Susan, uh, if you can hear me, um, can you just uh, put in the chat whether you're uh, calling in separately under a different line? I do have one total, I have one phone call in listener. I can certainly allow that person to talk, but I want to make sure it's, it's you so I'm not cutting off or giving somebody the opportunity to jump in the line. I'm sure folks want to make Susan? Uh, Mr. Klein, I'm, I'll try this uh, telephone call and listener and see uh, if that's Susan. Hold on a second. Susan, is that you on the phone? Susan, is Hi, that you? This, this is just a citizen neighbor, so oh. I have a lot of things, um, but I'll wait for my turn. So it's not okay. Susan. Thank Susan. you very much. I appreciate it. I don't on my camera, I mean on my computer. So. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna try uh, Susan for just one more minute here, okay. but I don't see a separate phone line and I'm not seemingly able to unmute her or see her video. Okay. Oh, it looks like she may have left the meeting and is trying to re-enter. Okay. Bear with me for one second, folks. I've also got a separate Susan here that could be a different Susan uh, since she had the username identified as the chair of the CONCOM. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna allow this Susan to talk to see if it's her. Hold on a second. All right. Hi, do we have our right Susan? She's on mute. Trying to unmute her. Rick, can you try to unmute uh, Susan, who's been promoted to a panelist? So I've got the wrong Susan. I'm not trying to force her to talk. Is that? Uh, so I can, yeah. Susan, is that you or a different Susan? I think I'm a different Susan. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, Sorry to disappoint. No, you never. <laughs> Hold on a second. Let me see if Ms. Chapnick is uh, redialed in. All right, I'm going to try one more uh, option here. We've got a new telephone in listening. 
Rick, can you try to unmute that phone number, please? That doing it, Doug? No, and I'm hitting the unmute button, but it doesn't seem to be working. Nope. All right, well, um, Mr. Chair, we don't- Hi, see... can you hear me now? Oh, can hear you now. Oh my, I'm so sorry. Everything was set up fine, and then it just, it just threw me out at the end of the, the presentation. Um, very sorry. <laughs> Very sorry for that delay. Um, do you still have time for my comments? Absolutely. Okay, great. Can I, can I just um, interject? Just, oh, thank you, sorry, go ahead. Sure. Go, I'm yeah. sorry, you were gonna go identify yourself, thank you. I was, yes. I'm Susan Chapnick, I'm the chair of the, Con the Arlington Conservation Commission. Um, the Conservation Commission in the town of Arlington usually administers the State Wetlands Protection Act as well as the Town of Arlington Wetlands Bylaw um, and the implementing regulations. These laws regulate work proposed in and near wetlands, as we all know. Additionally, the Conservation Commission has broader duties under the Massachusetts law to promote and protect the town's natural resources and the watershed. The reason I'm stating that is because it's a little confusing in the 40B arena. Um, where the um, issues of, of wetlands are discussed and decided and evaluated. So pursuant to the Comprehensive Permit Law, or 40B as we call it, the Zoning Board will be administering the town's bylaw when reviewing the Thorndike Place application, which is important, especially in light of the recent information um, very clearly stated by the applicant that they will be seeking waivers for our local bylaw. The Conservation Commission is providing background information and comments to assist the zoning board in this role. The Conservation Commission will still administer the state wetlands law so that the applicant will have to file an application with it to review the project under the Wetlands Protection Act. And at that point, we also do have the authority to review the um, wetland boundaries, the wetland delineation. To preserve the wetland resource area functions and mitigate potential harm to those functions, as well as to meet the standards in the town's wetland bylaw and implementing regulations, the Arlington Conservation Commission respectfully requests that the ZBA consider comments and recommendations as we detailed in our July 9, 2020 letter and that letter is on the ZBA website um, with key points that I'm going to summarize here um, within the next few minutes. I'm going to keep it very brief. Um, summary of our comments. The wetlands delineation, as we heard, was performed in the winter and supporting documentation for this delineation was, was missing from the application. A winter delineation is not compliant with our town bylaw regulations, which require that it's performed during the grow growing season so that the vegetation is leafed out and can be clearly identified. And so the soil can be clearly characterized. There are four wetland areas identified so far on the site, which Beta identified in their comment letter. One of these, which I'd like to point out, called isolated wetlands were not shown on the project plan, but they were previously identified and approved by the Conservation Commission back in 2001 by a then peer reviewed evaluation and the peer reviewer was the SC group. Two of the isolated wetlands at that, um, at that time that were, that were identified are located where current development is planned. Wildlife habitat evaluation was not presented in the application at all. An alternative analysis to building structures within resource areas was not provided as required by the town's wetland regulation for work within the adjacent upland resource area, which is the 100 foot buffer to resource areas. 
justifications for tree and vegetation removal, and details of proposed vegetation mitigation, including tree replacements as required to protect resource area values in the town's bylaw, were not provided. Stormwater management calculations, as we've discussed, um, were missing, and they were indicated that they would be submitted later. Flood storage calculations um, were missing information, including flood storage volumes that will be lost under the proposed project, alternative considerations, and calculations of compensatory flood storage. And again, it was mentioned that the town bylaw requires a two to one compensatory flood storage, which is two times as stringent as the state law. And this is by design in the town of Arlington to be protective of our resource areas. The applicant did not explain how the proposed project meets what is called the limited environmental impact review criteria. This is specified in the ZBA Comprehensive Permit Regulation, Section 6.2 and 6.3. Specifically, how the development demonstrates that it will, and I quote from that section 6.3, how will it improve water quality, control flooding, maintain ecological diversity, and promote adaptation to climate changes. The applicant has requested numerous waivers, um, most significantly, as was discussed, waivers to the local bylaw. However, insufficient information is presented to justify them. We urge the ZBA not to grant any waivers of the bylaw or town wetland regulations because of the important functions provided by the wetland resource areas on the property. Additionally, there is a history of major flood events in this part of Arlington that cause extensive property damage and contaminate resource areas with sewage from sanitary sewer overflow discharges. Prevention of additional flooding is a valid local concern and local concern is defined in 760 CMR 56.02 as Massachusetts regulation that warrants denying waivers of the bylaw and town wetland regulations. And in conclusion, we have many more details we'd like to discuss. Obviously, we'll hold them until the October 13th meeting or whatever meeting we decide is going to discuss this area of the project. And we look forward to assisting the ZBA and BETA um, in further evaluation and discuss discussion of the wetland resource area. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, are there questions from the either the board or from uh, BETA group in regards to the presentation of conservation? Yes, Mr. Rivalak. Yes, I'd, um, I would like to uh, thank Ms. Chapnick for her remarks. Um, one of the, th and earlier in the presentation, I saw um, you know, a slide that mentioned the 100 year base flood elevation being, I think, 6.8 feet. Um, you know, that, that was a piece of information I was actually looking for in the plans, and I, uh, I thank DSC for providing it. One of the things I'm personally curious about, I know, I know, I'm aware that Cambridge has invested uh, a significant amount of resources in uh, studying climate change vulnerability and, and the Alewife Brook area in particular. Uh, their CCVA impacted or had an impact on shaping their, um, you know, the Alewife District Handbook the Alewife District Plan, and it's also, to the best of my knowledge, uh, influenced some of the recent permitting decisions there. What I wonder if there's any possibility of us doing is finding the, you know, Cambridge's projections from the, um, their projected 100-year base flood elevation uh, for 2070, which I, I believe is what they are actually using for uh, permitting these days. So I'd, I'd be curious to know what that elevation is and where these and where these structures sit in relation to that. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Um, is that something that Beta Group can try to track down? Mr. Chair, maybe Todd Undis from Beta Group can chime in on that. Uh, sure, uh, Todd Undis from Beta. Um, I can, uh, or Beta can certainly uh, look into finding out um, specifically what what Cambridge is looking at from for a 2070 projection. Uh, I know that uh, I was just involved with a project. Um, over in uh, Braintree, where they also uh, had a, a 2070 projection. So we can uh, certainly uh, um, see if there's any correlation between the two and uh, see if it's uh, appropriate uh, to apply to this site as well. Um, just a question for Mr. Hessian. Um, the, in, in the original presentation back in 2016, there was a question raised about uh, culverts, existing culverts under Route 2 um, and their impact on uh, water translation throughout the area. And I was curious if um, in your research you have determined anything in regards to uh, those existing culverts uh, running under Route 2. Um, you know, nothing specific about the culverts themselves, but we did look very, you know, closely at the FEMA flood elevations and, you know, both upstream and downstream of this site, the flood elevation is 6.8. So it, it shows, it, you know, that doesn't speak directly to your question about the culverts, but it, it what I believe it demonstrates is that, um, you know, there, it's not a dramatic restriction or conveyance um, if, if, if it were, you'd likely see a difference in the flood elevations either on the upstream or downstream end. Um, it, it really, this area is um, very flat and the, the entire area per the FEMA flood study has the same flood elevation. And there are specific FEMA cross sections immediately upstream and downstream of this property. Is it known whether those culverts are even open? We have not gone and done a, you know, a um, detailed observation or inspection of the condition of those culverts. Are there any other questions from the board this time? Mr. Chair, I just want, want to note that uh, uh, Mr. Attorney Haverty uh, has joined uh, the meeting uh, to the agency to consult. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I just I wanted to zero in on something that Ms. Chapnick said and that I, th I think needs to be underscored. Um, Often in the application, it seems almost as though um, the applicant is unwilling or uh, unable maybe to provide information and therefore uh, is asking for a waiver. Um, but to me at least, a waiver has to be justified and information has to be provided for the waiver to be justified. So just to take, for example, the difference between a 1.1 compensatory storage and, and a two to one ratio, um, if we're going to undertake, and I'm not saying that we should, uh, but if we are going to undertake to wa waive that, it wouldn't necessarily be an all or nothing situation. And you'd have to have facts that would enable you to assess what the consequences are of what you're doing and to weigh those against whatever other considerations at the end of the line um, are important. Um, and so to me, that means that you sort of need to put the waiver idea after the getting the facts rather than use that as a substitute for getting the facts. 
uh, and I think that Ms. Chapnick is, is right on, that uh, as long as we're in a situation where we don't know what the Conservation Com Commission would want to know if it had to consider these issues, um, we can't really responsibly uh, go about waiving anything because we don't know what the consequences are of, of what we're doing. So it, it's obviously not a time right now to go into that in any great detail. We'll have that opportunity in October or some other time down the road. But I just want to stress how important it is to think of the waiver as something that you earn by sh making a showing rather than something that can obviate the necessity for making a showing. Thank you. Dr. Harm, are you aware of any other um, town boards or commissions who are looking to address this evening's? I had only heard for the Conservation Commission. Um, I could ask, uh, I I'm not personally aware. Uh, I can see if Ms. Rate uh, Heard from anybody? That's where you could let me know over chat if she heard from anybody that wanted to be heard as a member of a commission. Uh, we obviously have a number of folks from the public who are, have their hands raised, but I, I don't believe they're raised in the capacity as a member of a town board of body. Okay. Um, I'm seeing a uh, representative Dave Rogers has his hand up if you want to move when you're ready to move to public comment. Okay. As well as um, Brian Rary, Joanne Preston, and Clarissa Rowe at present. Okay. But let me know when you're ready to open to public comment. Uh, if you'd like to hear from Mr. Rogers first, uh, Representative Rogers, sorry, um, or any of the other members of the public. All right, so I, at this point, um, appreciate all the patience from the members of the public who are, have joined us for this meeting. Uh, I'd like to open the meeting up for public comment. I'd just like to reiterate, um, we would like to try to keep comments to three minutes uh, per person. Uh, there will be plenty of other opportunities um, to make comments and we strongly encourage people to uh, submit written comments. They can be uh, submitted either um, in right in, you know, you can send a letter to the town, you can send it via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. Um, those are all options. So, uh, Mr. Heim, if you wouldn't mind, um, we'll allow Mr. Rogers to, to speak. Representative Rogers, you've been uh, promoted. Uh, I. Um, unless uh, there's an objection, by the way, I will uh, take the, the beta group off of uh, the panelists for the time being. Unless the board has further questions. Uh, let me just get Representative Rogers. All right, there he is. <laughs> thank you. Good evening, everyone. And I want to thank the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals uh, for your service and uh, thank the public for their uh, due attention. Um, I want to keep this to within the, the three minute requirements so that everyone gets a chance to speak. Um, just a few things. Uh, first off, this project is universally opposed to reiterate what everyone knows, the uh, town meeting, the select board, the entire state delegation, and most importantly, the overwhelming majority of neighbors who live in this neighborhood for countless reasons. Uh, first off, traffic. We've heard talk of traffic. I mean, Lake Street is a parking lot. It is literally a gridlocked parking lot uh, prior to the pandemic. Now, obviously there's been a decline in traffic now, but it is egregiously bad. And this project with hundreds of cars making thousands of trips will only make it dramatically worse, increasing air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and just the diminution to the quality of life will be uh, unreal. Uh, most of the property uh, 
is in the FEMA floodplain map. And so um, we know with uh, climate change and with worsening data, yes, there's been a drought this summer, but we've seen rainfall events. We know that it will lead to greater flooding uh, and that those who live in the neighborhood will experience greater flooding and the Thorndike Field will experience greater flooding, which is uh, obviously a place for lac lacrosse and soccer and that uh, so many people and that will have a uh, decline in how often it can be used. Uh, we know that um, uh, the town will bear costs, not just water and sewer, but other costs. And as you've heard from the CONCOM and others, counsel to the town, uh, Mr. Witten, there's a lot of information that hasn't even been provided yet. So uh, I work in the legislature with other uh, state representatives and state senators, and I've never seen a 40B project either in the district I represent or in talking to all my colleagues who are state senators and state representatives that is so universally opposed. And so I urge the Zoning Board of Appeals to keep that in mind and that uh, we, uh, I, I hope that Oak Tree and the Mugar family will uh, continue to enter into a dialogue with the town to see how we can avoid this very misbegotten, um, misadventure of a project from ever taking place and what, whatever I can do at the state level, maybe through an environmental bond bill or otherwise to help perhaps raise money to enter into a deal or a transaction with the Mugar family in Oak Tree, I will do because this project is wrong for Arlington on so many levels. And finally, Arlington has made great strides on affordable housing. It has a housing production plan. And so it is manifestly unfair for a town that has done so much to try to improve its affordable housing stock with a plan to continue to do that, to bear the brunt of this, of this project. So um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. And I look forward to continuing to work with the town and the residents uh, to, to prevent this from going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, Mr. Klein, I have um, for hands raised, uh, I have Brian Rarig, Joanne Preston, I believe Clarissa Rowe, Patricia Brown, and Jennifer Griffith. So, I, so if you'd like, I can promote them in the order that I believe I saw them. Folks, I apologize. I do my best to try yeah, to. The list that I'm seeing does appear to be populating in order. So I think if you take them from the top, that will be appropriate. Terrific. So starting with Mr. Rary. Mr. Rary, you should be on. And let me know if you want to share, if anybody wants to, uh, to start their video, please just go ahead and ask. <clears throat> Thank you. Doug, are you hearing me? We can hear you, you. Yes. Great, great. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks to the board. For, uh, for entering into this process, which I know is going to consume much of their lives for many months to come. Um, and uh, um, I want to thank um, Mr. Hamlin and Mrs. Chapnick for their comments about the, uh, uh, the importance of, um, of, of giving very, very serious consideration before uh, considering any waivers of um, of local bylaws, in particular the local wetlands bylaw, it would be a travesty of public policy to waive Arlington's local wetlands bylaw in the case of the development of this site. There is no more sensitive site in the town of Arlington, and there's no better example of why um, a, a, a well-crafted local wetlands bylaw like Arlington's helps address issues of local concern um, in, in flooding and public safety. Um, <clears throat> so secondly, um, I wanna just observe that there's a, a, a provision in the Arlington Zoning Bylaw that I think may be missing in the conversation uh, that would affect at least the, uh, the boardwalk that is part of the proposal. Um, uh, which is that the, the zoning bylaw prohibits any construction in the uh, FEMA floodway. And I would suggest the proponent take a look at that provision. 
Um, and, and lastly, with respect to the wetlands delineation, um, it was discussed that the delineation was done in the winter time, which is uh, unproductive. Um, but there's another broader issue here that's peculiar to this site, which is that um, the site has been abused for at least 70 years um, under this ownership. Uh, the, the Nova Armstrong report commented on what is, what is widely observed public knowledge that there has been extraordinary amounts of dumping of solid waste landfill and other debris on the site over the decades. Now, whether or not that dumping is an attempt to fill wetlands, it may have the effect of filling wetlands. And a wetland doesn't cease to be a regulatory wetland just because it's dumped on. Um, there's a provision in the town of Arlington's Wetland regulations is 21B3 that observes that where an area has been disturbed, that uh, it is still to be counted as a wetland if it would support under undisturbed conditions a predominance of wetland indicator plants. So I think that on this site, more than any other ever in the town of Arlington, it's imperative that uh, the zoning board in um, enforcing the local wetlands bylaw and the CONCOM in enforcing the state wetlands bylaw thoroughly require that the issue of the impact of dumping on the wetlands be thoroughly investigated and that what would be wetlands other than for that uh, uh, illegal dumping um, uh, be taken into account now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Um, next would be uh, Ms. Preston. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, good. Um, uh, as someone who drives down Lake Street regularly, I have a particular concern about taking older data and extrapolating it to stand for the flow of traffic um, in the next few years. In particular, the Hardy School has added, which is on Lake Street, six more classrooms. So that is a dramatic change in that if you have only 10 students or faculty members per classroom, that's 60 cars a day, twice a day, five days a week, 10 months of the year. So I think any extrapolation should be done very, very carefully uh, given this consideration. Thank you. Um, Ms. Preston, why is there, um are those classrooms, obviously school's not in session at the moment, but are those classrooms constructed? And do you know yes. when they were opened? Yes. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> Very recently though. And the other thing it's a, there's a, what do they call it? Uh, a flex situation with the Thompson School so that students can be assigned to either school depending on enrollment, which means uh, a good number of students come from the other side of Mass Ave. So they would need to go down Lake Street to get there, to get to school. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, the next person on the list is Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe, let me know if you want to have your video on. Clarissa, are you, uh, Ms. Rowe, are you muted? Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Here I am. Um, thank you so much for listening to me, and you can put me on video if you want. Um, I'm, I want to um, thank the Zoning Board of Appeals, and I want to re reiterate everything that Brian Rearing said. 
about the environmental conditions. As most of you know, I'm a registered landscape architect. Um, I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 4. And as has been mentioned before, town meeting has voted three times in the last 15 years to be against this project. This is a, a very environmentally sensitive area of Arlington. And <clears throat> because of climate change, and although I'm glad to hear that the city of Cambridge has done a lot of work on the environmental aspects of what's going on in Al the Alewife um, watershed, they've also built right up to our town line. Um, and so all the water is coming over to Arlington. It, this is a terribly sensitive environmental site. And one of the things the land trust has done that is we have a movie of the um, four last flood events in the last 10 years, and we can send that um, to the Zoning Board of Appeals so you can really see the flooding and how it affects the neighborhood. This neighborhood, and by the way, the Hardy School is open. Um, it's right around the corner from my house. You will get to hear a lot of um, abutting neighbors talk about the problems of traffic and, and flooding, but I think this is a time in 2020 to really think about climate change. And there is in Arlington another 40B in the center of town without the environmental challenges. It's brand new, so um, I am just reviewing it, so I don't know exactly if there are problems with it, but none of the problems could possibly um, meet the kind of problem we have with this project. I'm very glad that John Hessian has finally put the correct <laughs> FEMA designations on a plan that we would see from Oak Tree. It's, it warms my soul. <laughs> and I thank you very much because um, that is just looking at the FEMA designation is something that's tremendously important to the neighborhood. And I would just urge you to work with the neighbors, to work with the coalition to save the Mugar wetlands and the Arlington Land Trust. We're here to help you. Um, we really, really hope that you will be open-minded and listen to these tremendously important environmental concerns. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, the next name on the list is Patricia Brown. Ms. Brown, just let me know if you'd like to be uh, shown on video. Oh, let me try to unmute you here. Patricia, can you hear us? Ms. Brown? Looks like we might have lost her. Oh, no, there she is. Ms. Brown, can you uh, hear us? We can't hear your audio. Mr. Chair, if you'd like, I can print them out. The next person on the list, and if Ms. Brown, when Ms. Brown, if she can get her audio working, we can move back to her after, after this comment. Absolutely. Um, so I'll bring up uh, Jennifer Griffiths. Griffith, excuse me. Ms. Griffith, can you hear us? Hmm. Tell you what, I'm gonna try to... Uh... There we go, I'm back. Oh, okay, go ahead, Ms. Brown. Okay. All right, sorry, please. Mr. Chair, that's your prerogative, not mine. No, please. Hi, am I, am I on? Yes, please. Yes, hi. Um, Patricia Brown, I'm on Mary Street. Um, one thing that I, that I really haven't heard talked about is, I don't know if any of the people who are proposing this project have any idea how many houses are actually in our neighborhood that's bounded by the bike path, Lake Street, and Route 2. I did a quick count, it's 234. So you guys are proposing to essentially double the size of our neighborhood. And 
where the neighborhood is, we have nowhere, <laughs> there, there's nowhere for else for traffic to go um, because we're bounded on two sides by Route 2 and um, the bike path. So Lake Street's it. So I'm concerned, obviously, about having an accurate traffic, traffic count. I'm also concerned about flooding, but I'll let people that are smarter than me um, debate that issue. But what I'm, two, two questions that I have. On one of the plans earlier, they showed an exit entrance ramp to Route 2. Has that disappeared? Uh, Ms. Kiefer, do you know the status of the negotiations with regards to Route 2? Um, I do not believe that there's been progress made um, with a potential access on, on to Route 2. Um, and I don't know if uh, Scott or John want to jump in on that. I would just add that I, I didn't mention that in one of the, as one of the changes in the revised plans, but um, the original exhibit that um, that was presented showed that that is not included in the current application materials. So it's off the table? At this point, yes. Okay, well that, that concerns me. The other thing that concerns me is based on the number of units that you have, overnight parking is not allowed on the streets of Arlington. So what happens when your parking lot fills up and where do the cars go? Um, I don't know. If, um, that's a question for Mr. Hessian. Uh, Ms. Keeper, do you have a person you'd like to address that? Um, we've provided uh, 304 parking spaces for, for the project, and, and I believe I, I'm going to have to go back to check on our waiver list, but I, I believe that we're satisfying the, uh, the parking requirements um, in Arlington. Um, and, and as I suggested previously, and then when Gwen was showing the plans, we have both surface parking and then underground parking. So if you just look at the plans, um, it's important to recognize that not just to look at the surface parking, that's not the limit of the parking, that we're also proposing um, parking underneath the, uh, the, the multifamily building. Sure, I get that. I understand, but uh, my, my question still stands. Parking lot fills up because people have gas, whatever. Where do those other cars go? That hasn't been addressed. Because I, 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 I think there is not going to be adequate parking, but that's beside the point. You guys can figure that out. Um, the third question that I have is the streets in our neighborhood, I'm on Mary Street, so I'm part of this, um, are very narrow. And when we have people parked on both sides of the street, which is pretty common during the day, um, I'm very concerned about the ability of A, traffic to get through and B, emergency vehicles to get through. Birch Street, which you've noted as, a, as an emergency um, access point, is no wider than any of the other streets. Okay. I'm going to take note of that. Um, thank you very much for your comments. Appreciate that. Mr. Klein, I believe Ms. Griffith is on now and uh, she's on the phone that 001 number. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Ms. Griffith. Oh, great. Hi, my name is Jennifer Griffith. I live at 4 Edith Street, uh, which is right near uh, and a butter to the um, property. Um, and I have uh, well, several quick comments and then some questions uh, about, so flooding is definitely a huge problem in this neighborhood. Nothing is gonna make it better and a project is only gonna make it worse. Um, when we have had flooding in the past, the sewer line has overflowed um, out on the street, so I don't think the sewer lines are, have the capacity to add a whole bunch more um, sewage from a huge development, so that's another issue. Um, my other questions, and um, I don't want to overgo my three minutes, so I'll just ask them, and then if people can answer them at some point, or the ZBA, I really appreciate all your your great work, and if you can get to the bottom of these. Um, one is construction that you're gonna do. Uh, it's probably gonna involve pounding pilings in 
when they were doing all that construction on the other side of Route 2, and the houses in this neighborhood all shook. Now you're going to do something just uh, several feet away from, from us, and so I'm wondering what you're going to do for our homes and our uh, foundations and our – because we are on land that is not um, solid here. Uh, two. Um, I'm wondering about the total height of the buildings because I know you developers, you're always very deceptive and sorry, uh, but in terms of the total height, because you're going to put HVAC and other utilities on the roof and it's going to end up being even taller and more unsightly, so I want to make sure that that's all considered, especially when the parking is going to be partially above ground, so you're not really just proposing a four-story building, it's going to be quite a bit bigger than that. Um, and the last thing is about traffic, and the prior uh, person did, um, did comment about that, is that this neighborhood is pretty quiet. Uh, there's, not, there's a lot of foot traffic in normal times. There's so many people park here to commute and walk to Alewife. Uh, the streets are narrow, and then you put the cars in there. And now you're going to add, so, and it's quiet. For the most part, we don't have a lot of traffic here. Now you're going to add hundreds and hundreds of cars going in and out, and I just, I'm very concerned about safety and, and access and about, um, yeah, what, what you're going to do to calm traffic and make sure that these people aren't zooming in and out on these small, narrow streets um, that we have. So I think there's just a multitude of problems with this project mainly because of the scale of it. I think, you know, I just wish you could make enough money. I mean, I think you could by just building those townhouses and forgetting the giant apartment building. This is just really a disaster. And um, I think that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Griffith. Um, we'll just, just as a note, Ms. Keeper, if you could, um, when we come back around to the discussion about the, the architectural features, if we could discuss um, the footings and the foundations, if they, if the, just if they could put that on the agenda for that too. Will do. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, Mr. Haim, I think uh, Mr. Holman, I believe is next. Holman, uh, hold on one second. Let me unmute you, sir. Uh, here's the, I'll give you the opportunity to start video if you like. Okay. Hello? Holman, I can't hear you. Sorry, go ahead. Sure. Please proceed. Oh, hello? Oh. Hello, Mr. Holman. We can see you. If you can go ahead and proceed. Oh, thank you. My, my screen was just switched. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Aram Holman, 12 Whittemore Street. Uh, I have a couple of comments, uh, predictably on flooding and traffic, but I would like to thank the board for being as receptive as it is to public comment. Uh, that's in notable contrast to the redevelopment board. A uh, couple of comments on zoning, flooding, and traffic. Uh, one purpose of zoning is to guide a town's development. Another is to balance the rights of property owners to enjoy their property, including by building on it, against the rights of other property, other property owners nearby to enjoy their property. And that includes protection from flooding. I think you'll agree that the history of flooding in this area, in particular, the five major floods that began in 1996 and show every sign of getting worse and the damage that they have caused puts a very high burden on the proponent to prove that their project will not worsen the flooding burden on the surrounding neighborhood. So far, they have completely failed to do so. In my opinion, 
they are incapable of doing so. Uh, with your permission, may I share my screen? Mr. Uh, uh, Klein, he's all set to share a screen if you would, uh, if you're okay with that. That is fine by me. Go ahead, Mr. Holman. Okay, hold on one moment. Can you still hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, I have three pictures to show of the Mugar site. I hope uh, this, this is... Uh, Sorry, Mr. Holman, we do not see your screen. You what? We do not see your screen. If you're sharing photos, we do not see them. Okay. Uh, how about now? No? No. Okay. Uh, that is okay. Thank you. That's okay. That's not going to work. Uh, I will suggest that people go to www.arfrr.org, and I will submit this as written comments, uh, directions where to find these photos. One is of it in 1951. The other is now, and the other is an artist's rendering of what a 100-year flood would do, not to this area, but to the proposed Vox project on the other side of Route 2 in Cambridge. I think one could easily extrapolate from that what it would look like to a proposal here. Uh, so I cannot show those pictures, so I'll skip over that. Another comment related to flooding. At the 2016 hearing, Ms. Noyes and Mr. Klipfel explained that if allowed to build, they would, quote, solve, end quote, the flooding problem on their site with the significant caveat that groundwater is not our purview. However, they refused to explain what they would do. So I'm wondering if perhaps Ms. Noyes and Mr. Klipfel could answer these three questions. Why the landowner, as a good neighbor, has never done this in the past. Two, precisely what they do, since they never described it. And three, since they made that little caveat, how would they distinguish between flooding from stormwater and flooding from groundwater? In my opinion, it's impossible to build on this site and not worsen the flooding problem. I can ask you to Similarly, wrap up. it is impossible to place housing here and not the traffic problem. I'm done. I urge the ZBA not to grant any permits to this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Um, I believe Mr. Seltzer is next. Sorry, Mr. Seltzer, hold on one second. Mr. Seltzer, you should be promoted to panelist. Um, let me see if I can help you uh, get your video going. Uh, that's okay. I don't need the video. I'll just stick to audio. Okay. Uh, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I've looked over the plans that were submitted, and I'm surprised to see that there doesn't seem to be any discussion of the major terrain transformation that is to take place. Uh, it looks like from the submitted plans that the entire northeast quadrant, two and a half acres, is to be raised around three to five feet above what it is now. Um, that's a lot of dirt. Uh, my back of the envelope com um, computation suggests that somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 large dump trucks coming through the neighborhood. I hope that in future discussions, the developer will discuss this in more detail, uh, specifically how much soil they're bringing in or whether they're dredging it from other parts of the property and what the logistics are going to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peltzer. Um, Mr. Heim, I see uh, Ms. M uh, Emma Murphy. Ms. Murphy, you've been promoted to panelist. Let me know if you'd like to have your video shown. I'll try to get you unmuted here. Hi there, can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Great. 
Thank you members of the board for being so open to public comments. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my concerns. My name is Emma Murphy. I live on Pondview Road, which is right off of Lake Street. And my primary concern with this development is the traffic. During non-COVID times, during rush hour, Lake Street is a parking lot. It's bumper to bumper. And as a, another resident who spoke previously pointed out, we have about 200 homes in, in the neighborhood. Some of those are two family homes. So I imagine the actual number is even larger. But if the development is accounting for approximately 300 parking spaces, we're effectively doubling the number of uh, vehicles in the area. And I'm very concerned about the impact that that's going to have on an already overburdened artery. And looking at the plans, it appears to me that Lake Street is the only main artery in or out of the development. So I am curious, um, I'm especially concerned about a traffic study being conducted under circumstances that will reflect traffic during normal non-pandemic circumstances. And I want to address that on the co-urbanize community website, there was some discussion posted by Oak Tree Development referring to a traffic survey of the Fox, the Vox development across Route 2. And I want to express my concern that I don't think that those survey results can be applied to our neighborhood because I think the demographic of the Vox development is very different from our East Arlington community. Um, so just want to advocate for a traffic study to be done under normal circumstances, not rushed um, and done in these times, and not to take survey findings out of context and apply them to our community. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to address the board? Um, if so, if you are online, if you could uh, digitally raise your hand, um, or if you are on the phone, I believe it's star nine. I don't see any hands right now, Ms. Mr. Chair. I agree with you. I do not see any either. And one more moment here. All right, seeing no further public comments, I'm going to close public comment for this evening. I thank all members of the public for their attendance and for uh, their participation. The next uh, section is a discussion of a tentative schedule for subsequent substantive hearings. Um, So the, the schedule, so the board uh, is currently scheduled to meet on um, the second Tuesday in September to deal with local issues, uh, just standard business. Um, that is September 8th. And so the next available slot to discuss um, this project would be on September 22nd. Uh, we had tentatively thought about um, having traffic flow and safety as a topic for that hearing, but it sounds like um, that may not be um, at a point where it's ready for for a more thorough discussion. Um, so, uh, just a, a question for Ms. Kiefer: uh, What would you what would you would like to recommend for the next topic we pick up, um, and should we consider uh, you know rescheduling re uh, reshifting some of these dates? Uh, well, when uh, um, when VSC and John Hessian made their made his presentation, um, I know that he had suggested that the 13th and the 27th um, hearings for wetlands impact, stormwater, and then general civil um, seemed appropriate. I I don't want to um, suggest without John weighing in on this if that could be moved up to September 22nd. Um, I, I recognize that, um, you know, there's, there's additional work that um, a BSC is going to be doing and, and consulting, obviously, with, uh, with the peer review. Um, and so, John, do you have any thoughts on 
whether if the 13th and the 27th hearings of October could be moved up to the 22nd and 13th. John, if I could just ask you to pause for one second. Um, Mr. Heim, if you could put the beta team back um, into the panelists. Already done. Already done, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Hessian, please continue. Sure. Um, you know, there there is a fair amount of work to, you know, thoroughly respond to the beta um, comments. And as I mentioned, especially with the wetlands, um, you know, scheduling time that works for our two wetland scientists and, and with beta to go out if, if the board was supportive of that um, confirmation um, of the wetland delineation. You know, co coordinating that time and then actually doing the work that needs to be done after that field work is done. Um, I don't think, Stephanie, that we would really be in a position to move any of that up to the September 22nd, especially trying to give some time to submit in advance, um, you know, of a tw September 22nd hearing. Uh, it really gives us two, maybe three weeks at the most, um, or probably not even two and a half weeks. And we have, um, you know, Labor Day, end of summer schedules to, to try to juggle and balance trying to be realistic I think that would be too aggressive and you know they all are kind of interconnected you know the wetlands is connected to the you know stormwater management is connected to the general civil engineering matters um, you know one is going to drive you know the next so With that being said, Mr. Chair, could I suggest that perhaps what we do is um, take that traffic flow and safety for September 22nd um, and take off a September 22nd date, have the next hearing October 13th with wetland impact stormwater, the following hearing civil engineering on the 27th, and then insert traffic flow and safety um, on November 10, and then move the architecture down to the um, November 24th. And, and it, it may be, I know this Thanksgiving week, it may be that the architecture landscape and then density over overall design could be all within one hearing. Mm. Oh, that's a good point. Um, and then otherwise, um, just getting down to what your item number six is, pro forma review, um, this again relates back to my comments from earlier this evening that um, if you look at the regulations, and, and maybe Mr. Haverty's on the phone right now, he wants to weigh in on this, but the, the regulations provide that um, under 56.056 when review of financials mm -hmm. may be appropriate. Um, and under your schedule, it's, it, it wouldn't be then um, because a board can only request a review or pro forma um, only after the following three conditions under the regulations. And then there are, are, are set out four specific preconditions and the board's not gonna be there on December 8th. So um, we can talk about that later, but I think that if, if there's anything, you would have to flip your proposed six and sevens and have your condition review and decision because at that point the board is suggesting what it would view to condition the, the project and if the applicant says we object to that because it's going to render um, uneconomic at that point you can ask to review. No absolutely I think part of the reason for having on the date we were suggesting is that we may have a preliminary list of, of conditions at that point um, that would then get you know after a review with pro forma, we could come up with a with a final decision. But I, I do agree um, that yeah, that the the detailed pro forma review would not come about until the we have um, a, a better decision about what the what waivers are um, are being requested are being considered. I guess is the proper way to put that. Um, so that turning to uh, to beta group, would that work? for you um, if we were to strike the hearing on September 22nd, we would continue with the wetland impact 
and general civil engineering uh, for the two October hearings, mm -hmm. and then move traffic to the beginning of November. Would that schedule work with, with your team? Mr. Chair, the um, October 13th would work. We would just need the information at least at least three weeks in advance of that. Okay. Mr. Hessian, did that, would you be able to get them information um, on or around the September 29th for final review? I guess part of the question too is the doing, uh, reviewing the wetlands delineation is something that would need to be negotiated coordinated between both teams. Right. And, you know, with the assumption that we're going to be in communication between now and September 29th and clarifying comments and, and providing information um, that, you know, that September 29th wouldn't be the first time that, you know, Beta saw anything from, from BSC. I think that's a, an, an achievable date. Okay. Uh, Mr. Valerelli, I think you have a question. Mr. Chairman, so I, I noticed that you're isolating a lot of dates um, and they're one after the other, it seems, not uh, withstanding the 22nd. So we have other requests for variances and special permits. I think we'd all be hard pressed to incorporate residential requests at a, at a meeting that we're having uh, regarding Thorndike Place, uh, okay. so much going on. I just don't know how we can do anything other than uh, focus on Thorndike Place that night. So I have to make a suggestion that um, we save one of those dates at least uh, three weeks from now for what I already have submitted to the ZBA. This has nothing to do with the four that we have teed up for uh, September 8th. This, these are two uh, additional requests. Uh, for special permits. That being said, we can't take all the dates. Uh, I need at least uh, one or two going forward, one right off the bat, say three or four weeks from now. Okay. And so I, know that, you, I know you're talking about October 13th and 27th. Right. If we can, I'm going to need one of those days. Could you use the date of September 22nd? Or is it, is it too late to advertise for that date? Hold on. It's too late by a week. Ah, crap. Okay. Um, is it too late for September 29th? No. So for members of the board, we typically try to meet the second and keep meetings the second and fourth Tuesdays. The 29th would be a fifth Tuesday um, in September. So just wanted to check with you guys if that date would be available in your, in your calendars. Works for me, Christian. Mr. Chair, I am available on the 29th. Okay. So am I. Oh, perfect. Bill gives us a thumbs up as well. Okay, so Rick, if we could do that, if we could schedule the September, so September 8th, we already have scheduled. If we could also schedule September 29th. Uh, correct, so we have a busy night September 8th. I yep. will go for September 29th, it gives me just enough time to get these, these ads in. And okay. it looks like on the 29th right now, we have two requests for special permits and uh, maybe some administrative business. But other than that, it shouldn't be too bad. Okay. And then is that all we have in front of us at the moment? Or are there other ones that you're aware of that are in the pipeline? No. So the ones I'm talking about that we're going to hear on the 29th were just submitted. Okay. Um, so providing that package is in good order. And I think it is, uh, we'll, we'll schedule that. We'll go forward with that on the 29th. Uh, we, we will take care of our business on uh, September 8th and then uh, we'll be free and clear. All right, so then we would have on September, so the two September meetings would be for routine business. The two October meetings would be for Thorndike Place in regards to wetlands impacts uh, and civil engineering. And for the moment, the two November 
dates would be for um, traffic and uh, in the sort of the built environment. And we can, obviously we can review as we move forward if we need to adjust those further. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other questions in regards to, to that schedule or are we good to proceed along those lines for now? All right, seeing none, sounds like we are. So we will proceed with along those lines. Um, just a general question, Mr. Heim, is it possible to download the contents of the chat? Um, I've gone ahead and saved that. I, I do want to caution folks that, you know, I've, I've made it clear that the, the chat is not really the ideal format for folks to, for the ZBA to process public comment. Yep. You've asked me to save it and I've saved it. Okay. That is item number eight. So that is, so then at this point, we will be looking to continue this hearing um, until 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, October 13th, uh, 2020. And at this point, I believe we will most likely still be on Zoom. Um, but we'll see what the recommendations are coming from the governor. Um, Mr. Heim, is there anything else I need to do in terms of? Uh, Mr. Klein, if, uh, Chairman Klein, I would just uh, check in with uh, Attorney Witten and Attorney Haverty. Um, but unless they have anything else, um, I think other than setting the next date for uh, resuming the hearing, okay. I don't have anything further. And okay. Mr. Klein, I have one thing I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Witten about in the board before we conclude. May I do that? Please. Um, in in terms of Attorney Witten's point in the completeness review, that um, in his memorandum of July seventh, two thousand twenty, that the application, apart from sharing information that we're going to be doing, that the application does not comply with Arlington's comprehensive permit regulations, and he had given in his memo that uh, a suggestion that we take a vote tonight. Um, to inform the applicant that the application does not comply with the regulations um, and to uh, ask that they make it comply. Um, I think it's important that we as a board uh, follow that recommendation, at least to preserve any rights we might have, um, that the application is not complete as submitted as required by the comprehensive regulation. So if Attorney Witten has any comment on that, but I would ask the board to strongly consider that they have any comment um, and if not I'd like to call for a vote that the applicants be instructed that the permit as filed and as updated to date does not comply with the Arlington comprehensive permit regulations and that they'd be asked to make uh, make it in compliance consistent with attorney Witten's memo within 30 days at least so that we can preserve our rights and then hopefully maybe get some more information Thank you. Mr. Witten, do you want to address that question by Mr. O'Rourke? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, the application is complete, incomplete. Um, I think the applicant has admitted that this evening. So uh, I think um, uh, Member O'Rourke's comment is appropriate, and I think a vote is memorialized and part of the record, and I think that's always helpful. So, yes, I oh, Mr. Witten, we lost your audio there. Uh, is that any better, Mr. Chairman? That is better. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm agreeing with uh, Member O'Rourke's suggestion um, and request for a motion because the application is incomplete, as we discussed earlier this evening. Thank you. Um, if I may provide some comments to yeah, that. Just one second. I was just going to ask uh, Mr. Haverty, because we've not heard from him this evening. Um, so at the beginning of the hearing, we spent some time discussing the completeness reviews um, that have been submitted both by uh, Mr. Witten and by Ms. Kiefer um, as to whether or not the application and the documentation we have in front of us is meeting with the requirements of the, uh, the comprehensive rules as established by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, but I wanted to ask you if you had um, looked into this at all and whether you had any opinion in that regards. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I did look at this a while back. Um, 
and I don't think it's probably the best time to rehash whatever discussion you had earlier tonight. Um, all I will say is that to the extent the applicant um, has not complied with all of the requirements of your comprehensive permit rules and regulations, they're either going to have to comply with them or they're gonna to have to request waivers. Um, your comprehensive permit rules and regulations are local rules and requirements, just like any other bylaw or regulation adopted in the town of Arlington. Under chapter 40B, an applicant has the right to request waivers. So if they don't believe that they should be providing you that information, then they should be requesting them. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Kiefer. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, as I had, um, again, not to rehash what I had stated at the beginning of this evening's hearing, but in March, we provided um, responses to Mr. Witten's preliminary um, completeness review. Um, and within that, um, we indicated those areas, th those requests within the board's um, application um, submittals that we had said that we intended to submit, but we submitted within the hearing process. Um, and as we talked about many times this evening, it's an iterative process. And so some, some pieces of information just do not make sense to be included at the very beginning. And we, and we had requested a waiver from the, from the local um, 40B application requirements. And for those, and I think it was probably very limited only, only to the request for our pro forma, we objected to that um, based on the, the regulations that I just cited previously. So um, I think that the there has there's been a, a good faith response from the applicant. Um, if you if you go back and you look at our March 2020 um, response, that that we have not abjectly refused to provide certain pieces of information. Um, what we've said is that we will provide this, you know, as, as the hearing goes on and. Um, we actually haven't, unfortunately, we haven't had yet feedback from the board itself as to just our, our, our layout. So, you know, it, it's a back and forth. And as um, someone from our team has said earlier tonight, you don't want to fully engineer a project at the beginning and then it's going to be tweaked. And so you keep fully engineering it. It's just, it's, it's a waste of resources for presenting to the board and, and for the applicant, quite frankly. So um, I don't think that there's any refusal right now. Um, and, and I would urge the board to go back and carefully our responses. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I fully um, hear Attorney Keeper. Um, I think she's making an argument that it's not that they won't comply, it's just that they haven't complied. But uh, Mr. O'Rourke's suggested motion, and one that we've discussed before, or at least I've provided in writing before, is not a legal argument. It's whether or not the application before the board is complete. That's yes or no. And if the board determines it's incomplete, what Member O'Rourke is suggesting is the board takes a vote, so there's a part of the record that reflects that as of this date, the application is incomplete. It's not making a subjective determination. It's not making an argument as to what might be waived. It's a fact that the application as of tonight is not complete. And Attorney Keeper can, can reserve all rights to request waivers. She has every right to do that. That's not what the discussion is. It's a binary decision. Is the application complete? Yes or no? If the answer is no, what Mr. O'Rourke is suggesting is that the board have a motion that is reflected in the record that makes that clear. Yeah, so we can conclude tonight, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, for my fellow members of the board, if you've read the comprehensive permit regulations, they were enacted for a reason. And they have specific requirements that the applications must meet in order to be submitted. And uh, Attorney Witten has taken the time to go through that and give us his opinion on where it is incomplete. So I would respectfully call for a motion, I, I respectfully move that the uh, applicant uh, be advised that the application is incomplete 
um, in the areas identified by Attorney Witten's memo dated July 7, 2020. Um, in, and it does not meet Arlington's comprehensive permit regulations and that it be advised to uh, um, bring their application into compliance consistent with Attorney Witten's memo within 30 days. I think this is something we need to do as a board to preserve our rights for the future. And I would so move. Mr. Chairman, if I may comment. Uh, just one second, uh, do I have a second on that? Sorry, Mr. Mills, was that a second? Second. Thank you. Ms. Kiefer. Yes. Uh, first of all, I, I would request that the board read the materials that we spent the time to submit and prepare rather than just rely upon what Mr. Witten has, has stated um, and, and to actively think about whether or not there's compliance and what hasn't been complied with. A number of Mr. Witten's comments state that it's unclear and what, is, what does that mean exactly? Um, further, we'd ask for a waiver from the um, local 40B application requirements. Um, and, you know, the presumption is that um, the need for affordable housing um, outweighs local concerns um, when you haven't met your 10%, which Arlington is at around the 5.6%. Um, and, and, and so by, by effectively requesting that we submit the materials within 30 days, um, I, I think one is not good faith considering that request for a waiver that we've, that we've sought. Um, secondly, um, there's information or there's, um, if you look at our March response, um, we've stated that we'll provide information. But again, this is the whole asking for information at the correct time in the hearing when it's useful to everyone rather than just arbitrarily saying, we want this immediately within 30 days. And I, we're happy to work with the board, but I think that the imposing a 30 day, you need to provide all of this. And then Mr. Witten becomes the arbiter of whether or not it's been completed without the board even, in, you know, telling me that they've looked at what our response has asked for um, is a bit much. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Witten, yes. So, you know, it's approaching 1030, but um, I, I have to strenuously object to Attorney Kiefer's representation that I am making any decisions here. That memo has been in the public domain since July. The board is presumed to have read it. Attorney Kiefer now insults the board and me by suggesting that the board is going to simply rubber stamp what I provide as a memo. That's just insulting and offensive. So, Mr. Chairman, the issue of the incompleteness is a matter of comparing what was filed with your regulations. And Attorney Kiefer and her client this evening has freely admitted the application is incomplete. Everybody on this call knows what a complete application means. Whether you're applying for a driver's license or a comprehensive permit, a complete application requires the filing of the required information. The board's the, the suggested motion is to confirm that as of tonight, the application is incomplete. That is a fact. Attorney Kiefer can argue it as she sees fit, but it is a fact that the application before the board is incomplete. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, it, I don't feel very comfortable supporting the motion because although I have read uh, the response, and I'm sure we all have done that, um, I'm not equally certain that in every single particular, um, I'm convinced that there's an incompleteness, even though in general, I don't think that you could, I mean, Ms. Kiefer herself is, is suggesting that it's a question of timing for much of the information rather than whether she'll provide it uh, at all. Um, and I do not want to begin every hearing with the same unproductive discussion that we started this hearing with. Um, what do we do when, when the applicant uh, doesn't provide all the information in 30 days? Do we dismiss the application? What would be the consequences of that? Um, so we won't do that. And we'll continue going on and reserving our rights and, and, and starting off on the wrong foot each time. 
Uh, it seems to me at the very least, if we want to clarify this, uh, we might ask uh, the applicant uh, to either provide the information uh, or to list what information uh, that they will not provide at this time. And if they need to request a waiver of the time limit in our, in our, uh, in our regulations or any other specific provision, they could make that request at, at that time. And that means that we don't have to make any findings now. We can listen to them again and we can actually take the waiver request into consideration, not as a general thing that we want you to waive everything, which too often appears, but as a way of sort of saying, these are the things we will provide, but this isn't the time for it yet. These are the things that we won't provide. And we request waivers to allow us the extension of time to provide them or whatever other waivers that they want to have. And that way we can take it back when we, when we take this up again and at least have some way forward and not just have a continual quarrel, which, which I think is wasting our time and it's not, it's wasting everyone's time. And it ultimately doesn't, I mean, we're not, you know, we're, we're sort of like the dog that chases the car. What are we going to do when we catch it? And the answer is we're not going to do anything when we catch it. So we might as well uh, do the best we can to create a process that will at least be resolved uh, the next time. So I would encourage Mr. O'Rourke to request, instead of request a provision of, of all the information, uh, to request either the, uh, the information to be provided or a specific waiver request to be made uh, with the representation of, of when very specific information will be provided. Um, a question for Mr. Haverty. Um, so the, at what point is the discussion typically in regards to whether the board will be accepting or granting waivers from specific local ordinances? Because it, it, it seems difficult where the comprehensive permit rules really are the, the entry gate to the process, um, but we're being, but it, it feels like the, there are waiver requests that come before that as to whether, you know, as to whether certain information is going to be provided as a part of the application. I'm, I was just curious with your, with your experience where that, how that is usually determined. So, Mr. Chairman, in most instances, the town really doesn't have quite as detailed comprehensive permit um, rules and regulations listing what submittals are required. So it's a little unusual to be getting into this sort of back and forth and with regard to submittals because the DHCD regulations do have a list of what is required for a comprehensive permit submittal. And they're, you know, a lot less stringent than what Arlington is requiring. Generally, you're going to talk about the waivers more at the end of the process because they become much more relevant. Um, as Attorney Kiefer has noted earlier, it, it's usually an iterative process with regard to the plans and the specific waiver requests become much more relevant when you get closer to what that final design is going to be. Um, so usually you wouldn't be dealing with this until the end, but I, I think that in this instance, you do need to deal with these questions now and I think that um, Board Member Hanlon's suggestion was a very, very good one, um, which is that the applicant really should either produce the materials within the next 30 days, provide the board with a time frame of when they would be submitted, or specify which requirements they're seeking a waiver from. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. O'Rourke, you would you be willing to accept that as a, an alternative? Yes. Um, so does the, so the, the, the motion in front of us is a, is the request to, uh, is that the finding that to date we are, the application is, in, is not complete for the written rules of the comprehensive current rules for the Zoning Board of Appeals. And we request that the applicant either provide the required information within 30 days or provide a, a schedule for delivery of materials or specifically indicate that they're requesting a waiver from that requirement. 
Is that essentially it, Mr. Rimmer? Yes, that is the motion. Okay. And it has been seconded by Mr. Mills? Second. Okay. I should probably take a roll call vote on this. Um, so start Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Uh, Mr. Revelak? Aye. And Mr. Ford? Aye. Okay. And the chair votes yes. Very good. Um, and Mr. Heim, do we need a vote on the continuance? I think it would be wise to okay. do it just to set the just to set it forward. Okay, so I move that the Zoning Board of Appeals um, issue a continuance on Thorndike the Thorndike Place hearing until Tuesday, October thirteenth at seven thirty p.m. Second. Second. Um, feel like I should take a roll call vote again, Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Klein votes aye as well. Great. Thank you all. Okay. Um, so I believe that is the end of all of these um, items that are on our agenda for this evening. Uh, so I wish to thank everyone for their participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I especially would like to thank uh, Mr. Valorelli and Mr. Heim for all their assistance in, uh, in the production of this meeting this evening. And uh, special thanks to the applicant and um, the planning board, the, excuse me, the Department of Planning and the uh, and beta group for their participation. I note again the board has this uh, has been recording this and it will be available on demand through acmi.tv in the next coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, you can send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. Uh, the email address is also listed on ZBA's website. Um, and so in conclusion, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. O'Rourke. A second? Second. <laughs> All those in favor will take a voice vote. Aye. 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 None opposed. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Jonathan. Thank you. Best to all. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye.